Let's get peppy. This is the big one. Pep 100. Woo! Dave's excited. Hey, Dr. I'm Dave. very excited. Yes. <laughs> That's Dr. Dave Smith, of course. And this is our 100th episode. I was trying to think of uh, of some way to celebrate. I've got I've got a celebratory Slurpee here. That's exciting. Lychee flavored, Dr. Dave. Lychee, fla- Lychee uh, flavored. Lychee is a fantastic flavoring in cocktails, but not in Slurpees. I've never had a lychee Slurpee before. I probably I'm not going to put you on the spot afterwards. You but I recommend it. lychee cocktails. Really recommend them. That's what it sounds like. Yes. Get um, lychee liqueur and um, uh, Amaro. Okay. Have yep. have one on us, please. Uh, I'm having the Slurpee. You can have the cocktails. Uh, I was looking for a celebratory song. I couldn't think of anything that had a hundred in it. I, I, got, right. I, I thought maybe I'd go with Nine Nine Love Balloons for YouTube because <laughs> we're missing that. <laughs> we only have to episode Nine Nine on YouTube. <laughs> yep. But uh, in the end, I thought the best way to celebrate is with the most joyous song. Well, in this part of the universe, at the very least. Okay. And what I'm referring to there, of course, is the Space Force song. I'm not sure if you heard this. This is real. I'm going to play it right now. What you're hearing underneath us is absolutely real. This is their official song. <laughs> and what a better way to celebrate. <laughs> yes. This is incredibly joyous. I... But just imagine... We just did this for a whole episode. Just listen to this. Yeah. And I got 42 seconds. Only 42 seconds. Yeah. Is there an extended <laughs> version? It feels like it goes for longer. Yes. <laughs> just... It reminds me of the Roger Ramjet thing. Oh, yeah. I can see that. To me, I'm not sure if it, what it reminds me more out of either something from American Dad, or <laughs> which, of course, is a parody of yes. this kind of thing, yeah. or the Police Academy song they always play right yeah you know, when they're when when they're, at the end when they're when they're winning awards and yes stuff. yeah yeah it's got a bit of that flavor to it yeah because the march <laughs> is a style of music that the americans have really made their own yeah and the key composer behind that was john philip Sousa. i can't believe you know we this. do not often get very <laughs> musicological on no. pep and i actually know nothing about music so you know that. i'm ready to be corrected but uh, years of living in the US, especially mm. in a college town mm. where college marching bands are a huge thing that I'm told are sort of appropriated from German culture. But mm. once again, Americans have really uh, made them their own. But mm. yeah, uh, they they love that stuff. And the most one of the best known is the very militaristic presidential march, Hail to the Chief. Yes, of course. Which is actually... Dun, so- dun, 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 dun. Yeah. yeah, I actually despise that song. But you, <laughs> Sorry. you hear that every uh, President's Day, which yeah. is in May, uh, car ads are all playing <laughs> Hail to the Chief. Like, what? come down to your local Ford dealership for great presidential deals. And that pl- Okay, that makes sense. I can, I can say yeah. that. Yeah, well... Well, let's hope when they start selling spaceships, they start playing this. That's right. And, and used spaceship deal ads. Uh, talking about celebration of Pep yes. 100, I, I like that. I like that you've gotten yourself a celebratory nose job. I assume <laughs> that's why. For those who who aren't yes. watching this, for those who are listening to this, Dave is sporting a strap across his nose. What, what's going on there? Yes, I had very minor surgery there this morning. Oh yeah, Mi- it, it minor was, surgery. You say minor surgery, not not cosmetic surgery. Mm. Uh, so, no, it wasn't that I had decided to go and um, <laughs> headbutt the talking dog statue outside the QVB <laughs> in celebration of Pep 100. It's not that I was confronted by an angry Pepper who was upset at the fact that I placed time limits on Chaz. <laughs> um, uh, yes. I don't think they exist. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it was very uh, minor non-cosmetic surgery. Right. Okay. I, I thought I thought maybe there might have been some kind of conflict. Maybe some. Maybe you were battling in the U.S. study center over likely voter models or something like that, and it all came to blows. There, no, <laughs> no blood should ever be shed over likely voter <laughs> no. models. Okay. Fair enough. All yeah. right. Um, for 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 those of you at home, we're also going to make some big changes for from the, for the next hundred episodes Huge to celebrate. Changes. Um, and that is that uh, we've been told by someone who, who will know who they are, but I'm not going to name them. <laughs> That apparently Dave's got a yes problem. <laughs> and That's right. What, what we're referring to here is uh, is uh, is when I speak at length, as I'm wont to do, when I'm trying, especially about either the law or legislation. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dave will show support. He'll be actually supportive, and you'll go yes, like that. Exactly. You'll say yes very loudly. But as it turns out, I'm a mumbler, 
And even though I turned myself up literally to the maximum level in, in, in the edit afterwards, yeah. you still can barely hear me. And Dave, even though I turned him down to the absolute minimum level, you can still hear him well over me. And his yes drowns me out. So you can't hear me. So, and that bothers this one person. And but Well, I know that it's not just that one person because <laughs> I was told the same thing. Yeah. During the last week in Zoom meetings that I have the same problem of... A yes problem. Loud affirmation yeah. of people, which then derails the meeting. <laughs> by, yeah, so uh, no more loud affirmations of Chaz. Sorry if that was one of your favourite parts of the show. From now on, what, what I'm going to do? do instead is... Mm, oh, that's good. Yes. That's really the, good. The Mike Moore from Frontline... <laughs> Mm. That's really good. I'm looking forward to these. Mm. I've, I've got a very long section in today's episode about the Inflation Reduction Act. I'm mm. expecting to hear a lot of mm's. Yeah. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. Okay. So uh, if you're wondering why Dave has become a, a an NPR broadcaster, it's because of this. We're trying to avoid this. And it's not related to my nose job either. No, no. no that's a good, good call. Uh, but the best way to celebrate triple figures, Dave, yes. is by me Sorry, doing... Oh, you just... <laughs> you felt the wagon immediately is by me doing what I do best, mm. which is being wrong. Let's start with corrections. <laughs> now this one comes comes from Facebook viewer Marco Fante. He is extremely annoyed, uh, annoyed to the point of caps at uh, the numbers that I've been throwing around about the national debt. Ah. And to be honest, he's right to be because I, I, let me tell you, let me talk you through what I did and why I'm wrong. I saw, I saw in the. Uh, the OMB figures that $63 billion of net interest paid in August, 2022. Mm -hmm. And I, I told you that mm. in about two podcasts ago. Mm. And then I told, and then I multiplied by 12 for you in case you couldn't to say on an annual basis, that's like $740 billion, which mm. is more than defense budget, etc. And he said, you can't do that. Because net interest paid changes every month. It's not like a mortgage where you're paying the same interest every month. It goes up and it goes down. And even worse, I projected a higher repayment based on higher interest rates, which came a week later. And he said, you can't do that either. Uh, and I'll just quote him. He's, a, he's an economics tutor, so that's better than me. <laughs> but, uh, outlays and revenues can vary greatly from month to month. The nature of bond issues, maturities, and variable rates is such that net interest outlays can also vary from year to year. There is no constant pattern. So I looked it up and I asked a few friends and they said, yeah, he's totally right and you're totally wrong. So, so my little homebrew estimates, they're bullshit. Okay. These are the set, the OMB estimates. Okay. $471 billion for the first 11 months of the fiscal year. Do not project another month forward. Yeah. <laughs> Just, uh, and that was before the latest okay. interest rate rise. That's still a lot of money. Mm. I don't think my point is invalid. It is but, less than half of what you were saying. Well, I was, I was saying that that was for this financial year, not next uh, financial okay. year. But but regardless, regardless, it was certainly less than seven hundred forty billion dollars, which mm. is what I which is what I said. Yes. Okay. So that is a lot less. Yes. So let's 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 just, let's just uh, you can make the point without being wrong. Okay. When I was wrong. Thank you for that, Marco. Okay. And for, I'm always happy when debt hawkishness turns out to be bullshit. <laughs> and a four hundred seventy one billion dollars. <laughs> And Philip Diamond on Facebook, uh, he picked me up a, a couple of weeks back, actually, but I just forgot to, to put this out there, mm -hmm. which was, I was talking about, I'm not sure if I was talking to you or, or one of our guests, mm -hmm. the Groningen gas field in the Netherlands. Which that is one was of the, to me. Yeah, which is one of the, great, one of yes, the biggest gas fields I in the world. Which I've never heard of before. Yeah, well, it, it exists. It's one of the biggest gas fields in the world. The Dutch have control over it. Mm -hmm. And I... I suggested that if things got really, really, I said that the problem is a problem with it, which mm -hmm. is it causes earthquakes. Yep. Um, but if things get really dire, like if, yeah, if they're, if they're killing each other and cooking each other for, for meat mm -hmm. and on campfires, mm -hmm. they can flick a switch and they can get gas, albeit earthquake, <laughs> earthquake ridden <laughs> gas if they need to. He made the point that it has another problem, which What's is that? that it has the gas has a high amount of dinitrogen nitrogen in it, which means the energy value is low, so it needs special burners. That doesn't mean they can't use it. It just means that that's another problem. So right. so maybe maybe they need to be cooking each other, and I don't know, maybe having like a civil war with clubs or something before they crack open that gas field. I don't know what and, and it requires, but okay. it's not as simple as flicking a switch. Right. Yeah. More needs to be done. So I just want to get that out there as well. Any other corrections, anyone? Let me know. <laughs> I will address them at the right top of the episode, right after I have a little lychee smoothie. Oh, a uh, Slurpee. Mm. 
scrumptious. Um, I'm not getting sponsored by <laughs> the makers of Slurpees, by the way, if, if ABC's watching. Okay, updates. Uh, we've got a student loan update. Uh, well, the student debt repayment thing update. And that is, uh, we talked about how if it gets to court, mm. the whole student debt relief thing is probably going to be done. Yeah. <laughs> it's not, I'd say so. Yeah. Um, there, but the, the major issue is it getting to court because standing is a mm. massive issue. When I say standing, to get to the Supreme Court or any of those courts, you need to have a victim, someone who has been damaged by this policy. Now, Congress is the obvious victim in this case here in that the, what they're accusing Biden of doing is is arrogating Congress's responsibilities. Yes. Right? That, that's, the whole, that's the whole complaint. Uh, but the Democrat Congress, something tells me, is not going to take Biden to court <laughs> anytime soon. Uh, now, if Republicans win Congress, then they almost certainly mm. will, but mm. that is months away yet. Mm. So uh, what happens in the meantime? How are you going to find, if you're a Republican, you want to stop this? or you're someone who cares about the Constitution, <laughs> I say bitterly, uh, how are you going to find someone who is damaged by getting free money, which is what this uh, is? Are they going to claim that people who already paid their debts back are getting damaged by this? Nope, because that person that person is not being... It, that, that person does not pay an extra dollar. They they can feel it's unfair, yeah. but, but you need that to is, at least pay an extra dollar. That is very true, but I'm yeah. trying to think like a sure. Republican well, here. Let me let let me help you yes. <laughs> think you're like a Republican by okay. citing a Republican. Okay. A fellow called Frank Garrison. Now he's a lawyer mm -hmm. at the Pacific Legal Foundation, which is one of those conservative groups that, that basically runs ideological lawsuits mm -hmm. until they can get one up to the Supreme Court. So it's quite fortuitous that he happens to have a certain number of circumstances that might be relevant in this case. Yes. Which is He's been paying his student loan off through an income-driven repayment program, which mm -hmm. is a little like our programs in Australia, where yep. it's a percentage of, of your income. Now, this particular income-driven repayment program forgives the balance of your loan after you've made a certain number of payments. He's, basically, his loan has gotten to the point where it will be forgiven under this program. Mm. He doesn't need to do anything more. He doesn't make, need to make any more payments. It will right. be forgiven, Right. In Indiana, where he lives, if his loan is forgiven under this program, he will not have to pay any taxes, mm. zero taxes. But under Indiana law, if it's forgiven by Biden's forgiveness plan, he will have to pay taxes on what's forgiven. He'll have to pay $1,000 tax under Indiana law. <laughs> so he's saying, I'm being damaged because I'm going to be charged a $1,000 tax for my forgiveness that I wouldn't have been charged otherwise if this, if this program hadn't been in place. Mm. So that's his damage, right? Now, obviously, this is disingenuous. He doesn't care about the tax at all. He's looking for a fig leaf in order to get to the court. Mm. But that's the stupid system we have, that is where you need a fig leaf before you can go to the court. Okay, so uh, as soon as Garrison filed that lawsuit, like literally the same day as he filed that lawsuit, the White House, which was fine-tuning the program because mm -hmm. it hasn't been finalized yet, decided the essential part of the program is that it would be an opt-in program. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. so, so if you don't want to, you can just opt out of the program. That's right. So, uh, uh, so they told him. They told him personally they had nullified his lawsuit. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, so no more damage. I thought you were going to say that he is claiming he was damaged by being forgiven because that's taught him bad, irresponsible <laughs> habits with personal finance. No, but you should be a lawyer. <laughs> anyway, uh, now he's still, I don't think he's taking their word for it. I think he's still taking it to court. Whether the court accepts that or not, we mm. shall see. Furthermore, a day later, six states sued the government because they said Biden's program will damage their state tax, tax collections. Right. Because they take a certain amount of tax off repayments. Mm. So the, um, that is, uh, well, that, that may hold up. That may not hold up. We'll find that out. That, seems more likely to hold up. Yeah, we'll see. Either way, yeah. none of them actually matter. No. Like 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 none of these people, either the states or the Frank this Frank Garrison dude really care. They just want an injunction for the next two months. Yes. Assuming the Republicans take the House. Because mm. as soon as the Republicans take the House, they will take over. It'll be the most obvious court case and they will presumably win, but we shall see. Um, so the, all they want is a two month injunction. Because mm. otherwise the Biden White House appears to be handing out this money in the next week or two. Mm. So that's the, that's the bid. The bid is trying to stop that yep. until the Republicans take the House. We'll see what happens. Anyway, that's where we're at. Okay. I should say as an aside, this whole dance is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. The standing dance. It's the same as that stupid Texas law. Remember HB6? Oh, yes, I the remember The abortion that. law where, yes. where, where you couldn't, like it, because of the, the weird standing rules, like you just, you, they couldn't 
find a way to sue yes. Texas, even though this law was clearly against the constitution. It was clearly mm. making abortion, yeah. which at that point in time was constitutional according to the Supreme Court. Mm. Uh, that was, they were clearly making it illegal unconstitutionally, but no one could find a way to sue them. And so my view is they should just get rid of standing. Mm. Like the Supreme Court chooses which cases it hears anyway. Yeah. So you should just be able to apply. And anyway, but uh, that's that, that's aside. Mm. Let's talk about Ukraine. That's because there's plenty of yes. updates there, there are on updates. Ukraine. Yes. Do you want to kick us off? Yeah. Well, I keep coming back to this issue of the draft. Yep. Because it is, I think, so politically important. And so we noted last week that at that point Putin had just announced mm. a draft. Yep. In the last 24 hours, he's gone on TV to apologise for things that have gone wrong with the draft. So what's he apologising for? So among other things, uh, the age limit has apparently been ignored. <laughs> ignored? A lot, a lot of the time. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, and other rules around mm. who is actually uh, eligible have been mm. ignored. Now, the way that Putin is framing this, he's putting the blame on the military. And certainly so far for Putin but also for his allies, because his allies need a way to voice their discontent without directly bl blaming Putin himself. So mm. there's a lot of blame being focused on the Russian military mm. at the moment. And part of the problem with the Russian military is corruption from top to bottom. Mm. This is not anti-Putin propaganda. This is a very well-known problem. Mm. There are theories that one of the reasons why... Uh, such a high level of corruption is tolerated in the Russian military is because it then makes it very easy to get rid of people if you want to get rid of people for some reason because they've almost certainly been engaging uh, in corruption. Lots of open windows in the military. Yeah. Watch out. However, this is not the kind of thing that you want when you're trying to mobilise the population for war. Those reports of people leaving the country are now... Like last week, I think we were saying we weren't quite sure whether they're credible. Now, they're not only credible, yeah. they are everywhere. Yeah, there's photos. Um, 261,000 people, men, yes. apparently left Russia between Wednesday and Saturday night. Yes, yeah. <laughs> That's quite that excellent. last week. There have been yeah, yeah plenty more yeah. Uh, since then. Yeah. So there are lots of people leaving. There are social media videos freely circulating in Russia mocking the entire effort. Mm. Uh, yeah, it, it is every bit the disaster that Putin feared that it would be. And there have been protests mm. uh, against it, which are fairly unusual. Yeah. Yeah. Especially and, given that you get 15 years jail for protesting a war. Yeah. And so the <laughs> fact that he feels the need to act actively apologise for the things that are going wrong mm. in the draft suggests that it is not going very well. I should say that 2,400 demonstrators have been, were arrested in the first week after mobilisation. So, And like I said, 15 years jail for public opposition to the war. significant. Yeah. Also, when we did this last week, had the oh. UN General Assembly taken place yet? Uh, I don't think we mentioned it. We didn't mention but it, but uh, something that is worth mentioning there is, so at the UN General Assembly, Zelensky gave one of his... Uh, Video link addresses, which is where he's wearing olive t shirt. Yeah, he has basically yeah. mastered the form of the video link address. He may well be remembered as the man who saved Ukrainian independence by history, but he will definitely be remembered by history as the man who was the absolute master of the video link address in, yeah. uh, in 2022. Uh, Russia did not want him to give that address, but he did it. And he said in that address that Ukraine is going to get all of its territory back. Including Crimea. Including Crimea. Okay. It was a pretty uncompromising message. And Biden then gave a speech afterwards where he said that the war had to end on just terms, which was Ukraine getting its territory back. Now, he was a bit more ambiguous about exactly what that meant. Like Zelensky has been very clear about, mm. it, about getting all of it back. But... It certainly does seem to indicate that the US, as it has been doing all along, is backing complete Ukrainian victory. It's not going for a negotiated settlement. The reason why I, I for those at home, uh, I isolated Crimea. I said even yes. Crimea is because there are a lot of Russians in Crimea. There are a lot of Russians. <laughs> it's in Crimea. Like so, yes. so that's a, that's a, that's a a complicated. Uh, choice, and I'm not going to go into too much detail here because I've got I've actually officially got El yeah. Hardy 
Oh, excellent. Next week, El Hardy is going to be a midweek pet. Oh, fantastic. And she lived in Ukraine. Yes, she did. So, so I'm going to ask her a lot of details about yes, this. Yes, yeah. But, um, uh, but that, yeah, but that is a big deal. If, 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 if America backs up Ukraine on Crimea, yeah. then, then this is going to be going for a long time. Yes, it is. <laughs> and, yeah. um, and it's going to, it's going to be quite complicated. Uh, I was just going to say, um, oh, by the way, Zelensky didn't just save, save, uh, it isn't just the patron saint of video links to the mm. UN. He's also the patron saint of Lowe's because, like I said, his his dress sense is my he's my favorite out of all the politicians in the world. Like he gets yeah. around like me. If I was going to be a if, if I ever was going to do politics, I'd go to Ukraine where you could just get around polo shirts and t shirts and everyone loves you. It'd be awesome. <laughs> what a guy. What a man. Anyway, um, as far as dissent I, goes, I think there does have to be a war going on. Are you sure about that? For that look to be. Did, did he walk around in suits before then? I don't know. There's some homework for you, Peppers. <laughs> what did Zelensky wear before the war began? And how long did the war have to go on before he, before he cracked out the polo shirts and T-shirts? What a champ. Anyway, um, as far as the dissent goes, the, the, thing, the interesting thing about Russia is that they... It has been massive dissent. As you said, I'm not surprised Putin is back down. Because even even the editor in chief of RT, like this is a yeah. Russia like that's a government that's a government news agency, right? Yes. Yeah. The editor in chief was tweeting out incorrect mobilizations. A sixty three year old mm. with diabetes, a thirty five year old with a spinal fracture and artificial vertebrae, et cetera. She was she tweeted out this, yeah. this long thread filled with and she's his number one cheerleader. So you go, yes. wow, he's He's got to respond. But the other thing is Russians have a unique way of protesting since they aren't allowed to protest in the street. Mm. They protest by blowing up uh, administrative offices. And 17 of them have been blown up in the uh, last week. And and a recruiting officer was shot in the head. So um, they, so they have their own way of showing dissent. Yeah, pretty clear <laughs> statement. <laughs> yes. uh, another thing that we have to mention that we have touched on mm. before is although we talk a lot and the Western media talks a lot mm. about the kind of Western alliance, mm. Uh, against Russia, it's also worth mentioning that Russia really appears to be losing ground in Central Asia. So among countries that have been fairly staunch allies of it, like Kazakhstan, yeah, um, it's that they are really vocally against what Russia is doing in Ukraine, which is another sign that Russia is not in a in a position of strength. Kazakhstan's taking a lot of these fleeing Russians as well. Yes, it is. By the way, do, do you have a view on whether countries should be taking the Russians or not? Because like Belarus, Estonia, they're not. Poland, mm. are not. I can kind of understand why Belarus and Estonia wouldn't want to, given they were oppressed by Russia until quite recently. Yeah. And, uh, and also... Um, well, well, Belarus wouldn't because Lukashenko is Putin's ally. Yeah. He wouldn't want Russian deserters. This, uh, but no, that he... Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, good point. Yes. That's right. That's true, yeah. But also on top of that, like from a, okay, let, leaving aside that, like so let's take Estonia then. Yeah. Um, if you're a country right next to Russia, you probably don't want to have a huge number of ethnic Russians in you, given what's going on in Ukraine at the moment, if you know what I mean. Possibly. Yes. <laughs> like there might be a special military operation coming your way in a couple of years' time yeah. if you have too many ethnic Russians. I, I mean, the, having said that, it seems to me a good strategy to try and take as many of these Russian, fleeing mm. Russians as possible. Sure, it will compromise their, yeah. their draft and it will compromise... Putin's propaganda as well. You'd think least. so. Anyway. I think it's for every country to make their own decisions. Oh, I'm not preaching. I'm just saying. <laughs> Germany's taking them, by the way. Yeah, of course and, they are. And Ukraine certainly are. <laughs> yes. Um, but the other area, okay, that's one That's one, That's one. one problem with the draft. But yeah. I actually think there's a bigger problem with the draft. I mean, yeah. look, that's a pretty big problem, the fact that Putin needs to apologise because it's so shoddily uh, administrated. But the other problem is the whole existence of it in the first place is a problem because, and we did touch on this before, but I want to go into more detail. Um. They don't, they, they don't have the facilities to use a draft, even when you get the people. Mm, they don't yes. know what to do with them. And I, 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 let me tell you what I'm referring to. The last time I was a mobilization was 1941. They mm. haven't done it for a while, right? Yeah. And the Russian military system is not designed to, to take a big, huge influx in people because mm. they tried to go full voluntary military like America did mm. like 15 years ago, found it too expensive. And so now they've done this hybrid of volunteers yes. and one year conscripts f since 2008. The problem is in one year, you don't have a time, you don't have time to learn much mm. of anything. You can't mm. become competent in a year. Usually you need at least two years to become competent. Right. And so you have the people they're drafting now are they, well, the people they're supposed to be drafting now, as opposed to 63 year olds with, with diabetes 
are supposed to be these one year guys, mm. like the guys who weren't part of the army. They did a year and now you get them in. But if you think about it, anyone under the age of 32 mm. is going to be a one year and not a two year. Mm. Cause that's when they went fl flick from two year to one year. Right. Mm. So anyone who's young enough to draft at this point in time mm. is going to be under trained. So they need to train but they don't have any train facilities because they, because they, at the moment they are overrun mm. in, in, in Ukraine. They don't have the resources. And so there are just endless clips being flooding YouTube at the moment and, and Twitter and so forth of Russians saying, I have had no training. I'm going to curse them in two days time. Mm. And like the, and, and some of these people have been tracked down too, identified by mm. news organizations because they go, Oh, this is Ukrainian propaganda. No real Russian. They found the Russian, mm. <laughs> right? So the, so I mean, that, that, if you just drop someone into a war zone with no training who knows what they're doing, they're more of a problem than, than a benefit. Mm. They just get in the way. Like, and so the, uh, um, and who's going to command these people? Because, they, because they've lost all the commanders as well, right? Mm. Um, and on top of that, you're doing well with the M's, by the way, Dave. I'm mm. liking it. <laughs> mm. <laughs> the next hundred are off to a flyer. Um, uh, and, and in fact, there was a viral clip. I mean, I would play you these clips. Cause you know, I like to play clips. I don't like to, I like to show you actuality, but they're all in Russian. So it's, it's a, bit, a bit difficult for an audio podcast, but there's one clip where there's a medic, um, telling this was, is also apparently being verified. There's a medic telling trainees, you've got to go and get your own tourniquets. You got to get your own sleeping bags. We just don't have them. We have your uniform and we, your basic weapons. Yeah. But other than that, you need to get all this stuff and, I would advise you to bring as many tampons and pads mm. as possible. Yeah, I saw that one. To 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 block your wounds up. Yeah. <laughs> it's just which is yeah, that's that's not a great position to be in. And so what I'm saying is if you're gonna create all this nuisance, all these all these problems on the domestic front, you wanna get a good military payoff. Mm. And if anything, this is a negative military payoff, mm. which I think is actually the <laughs> doing very well. Is um actually the biggest problem myself with this draft. I mean you have any thoughts about that? Not really. No, okay. You've summed Fair up right. the problems pretty well. Thank there. you. Thank you very much. All right, let's just, we, we can't, before we move off Ukraine, we can't go past, there are two stories which were very big this week, which we just have to mention if we're mentioning Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Number one, annexing. The referendum results yes. are in. Yes. Like we, uh, uh, let me tell you the big numbers. Drum roll. In Zaporizhia, 98.19% in favor of Russia. In Kherson, 96.97% in favor. In Donetsk, 97.91%. And in Luhansk, 97.82% in favor of reunifying with Russia. What do you reckon? Any problems there? <laughs> Not trying very hard, are they? No. <laughs> Even Saddam Hussein would go, come on, guys, at least make a 93%. <laughs> I, when I was doing my PhD, mm. at one point, I remember looking at this project called the Soviet Interview Project that was conducted by American researchers in the 1980s, where they interviewed thousands of people who had left the Soviet Union, mm. uh, which is obviously... A, a self-selecting bunch of people who had problems with the regime, whatever. But in the Soviet Union would often have these elections with only one person on the ballot. Mm. Uh, and I was uh, on, on this chaotic mission to find in this survey research people who claimed that they had not voted for that one candidate on, on the ballot. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> What I'm suggesting is <laughs> for older people, yeah. this actually may bring back some nostalgic memories. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, I, probably also they, they'd get nostalgia from the, some of the videos I've seen of people carrying around the ballot box door to door with dudes <laughs> with guns literally standing there while you vote. Very convenient. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, like I, I mean, I don't think anyone's taking that too seriously, but yeah, but um, we just have to mention it. Mm. Nord Stream, I want to mention that. Yes, now, this is actually very serious. Um, there were three leaks in the the two pipelines on the same day, I believe, or at least close to the same day. Any leak would be unlikely because it's you know well underwater; it's very hard to get to. Um, so three leaks together is sus, suggests sabotage. Um, let me tell you what we know. We know the CIA issued a vague warning in June to a number of European nations, including Germany, that the two Nord Stream gas pipelines that carry natural gas 
could be targeted. We don't know who they said would target it, mm -hmm. but could be targeted. We know that neither pipeline was actually pumping gas at that point in time. Mm. Uh, Germany had already withdrawn authorization for Nord Stream 2 and Nord Stream 1 has been shut off for technical reasons, according to Russia. We know that at almost exactly the same time as the Baltic gas, uh, the most exact same time as that happened, the Baltic gas pipe opened, connecting Norway to Poland. Right. We also know that Russia's state-run energy supplier Gazprom threatened to cut off flows of gas to Europe with its only remaining pipeline uh, along land because of a contract dispute. And we know that in June, the US Navy joined other NATO members for Ball Tops 22, a series of maritime exercises in the Baltic Sea near the location of the Nord Stream pipeline leaks. Sounds like a festival. <laughs> a festival of... Ball Tops of, 22. Of, of shipping. It's like Firefest for, <laughs> for people who like ice. Uh, and, and finally, we know that apparently, well, this is, I say apparently, so we don't know this, we think that European security officials on Monday and Tuesday observed Russian Navy support ships in the vicinity of the leaks in the Nord Stream pipelines, and Russian submarines were also observed not far from those areas last week, but lots of ships go through that region. Mm. So, that, so that's the information. Now, that information to me, I'm not seeing any conclusions from that. That's all pretty circumstantial stuff. Um, but while you're fetching Scooby-Doo to figure that all out, um, a, Pol a Polish politician did tweet, thank you, USA, for the pipeline sabotage. He didn't say for the pipeline sabotage. We showed a video, a, a photo of it. Right. That guy's not connected to anyone or anything, so I don't know why we care that he tweeted that. Okay. But Tucker Carlson cared. <laughs> uh, and, and Russia cared as well. Russia also, or the, some Russian, the Russian ambassador retweeted that. And this old Biden clip from February this year resurfaced on the internet mysteriously. If Russia invades, uh, that means tanks or troops crossing the, uh, the, the border of Ukraine uh, again, then uh, there, will be, uh, we, there will be no longer a Nord Stream 2. We, we will bring an end to it. What do, what, how, will you, how will you do that? Exactly, since the project and control of the project is within Germany's control. We will, uh, I promise you, we'll be able to do it. Oh, sinister. <laughs> okay, so, Dave, do you have anything to say before I go into a little rant about Tucker Carlson? <laughs> uh, I'm just going to let you go. Jess. Okay, all right. Um, now, I'm not, at this point, I'm not drawing any conclusions. Okay. About who could have done it. That is sensible. It could have been environmentalists, potentially, with uh, with pretty high-tech environmentalists, I might add. Mm. I think it's unlikely. But, you know, I'm just, just saying. Mm. Could have been energy competitors of Russia, like other countries produce energy. Could have been America. Could have been Russia trying to pressure Europe more mm. or trying to make it look like America mm. as well. Uh, I, think, I think so far we've seen very little evidence of anything. Yeah. Tucker Carlson disagrees. He ran a 10-minute editorial essentially accusing America of doing it. He started off with lots of, well, who knows? And we can't be sure. It's just like I started just now. Mm. Except that he ended it by basically saying America was about to start World War III. Right. right? So it was pretty clear who he blamed. Now, he, he based it around largely that clip I just played you, that, that Biden clip. He liked that clip a lot, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. The thing I like about this is normally Tucker Carlson will portray Biden as this totally senile, gibbering fool. Yeah. But now, using that clip as primary evidence, Biden's an ice-cold killer who drops clinical <laughs> threats six months out before delivering the killer blow. But this is the most telling way you can tell Tucker Carlson's reaching. This is what he said directly after he played that clip. Notice how he phrased that. And he's the president. Doesn't phrase things by accident, particularly when he's reading off cards. He didn't say, I will pause the delivery of gas from Russia to Germany. He said, there won't be a Nord Stream 2. We'll put an end to it. We'll take it out. We'll blow it up. How will you do this? He was asked. I promise you we will be able to do it. They thought this through. Now, did you, did you catch that bit where he said, we'll blow it up? No. I, I don't remember Biden saying, we'll blow it up. That's an interesting little, little addition you put in there, Tucker, to what Biden said, we'll blow it up. Actually, he didn't say that at all. Because uh, in actual fact... Biden did get rid of Nord Stream 2. He did, not by blowing it up, but two weeks after that clip that you saw there, Germany withdrew authorization mm. for Nord Stream 2. Mysteriously, out of nowhere, without any giving any reason whatsoever. I wonder what happened. 
I think maybe Biden might have had some words to Germany. I think that's maybe what happened. Mm. I don't think he needed to put on the wetsuit and dive 100 metres underwater and <laughs> blow up the pipeline so six months later. Everyone who was hoping for a return to the glory days of CIA clandestine missions mm. in the 1950s and early 60s when the US was destabilising or overthrowing governments in other countries and attempting ass assassinations of foreign leaders. Sorry. <laughs> well, look, uh, look, I don't want to even go that far. I'm not saying America didn't do it. I, I, like, You're I don't not know. saying they didn't. I don't know. Mm. I'm just saying that there is a very, very, very simple, obvious explanation if you don't have, if you're not exhibiting bad faith <laughs> as to why that clip of Biden could exist and, and someone in America did not take out the pipeline. That's all I'm saying. I'm saying if you were trying to be fair yeah. in any way, shape or form, you would acknowledge that there is no evidence at all at this point in time that America did it. Or, and, and there's certainly not enough evidence to... to, to I think just by anyone. discussing this, we're giving it unnecessary no, credibility. There is a reason why I'm bringing this up. Okay. Because this is going somewhere. Okay. Because there is something else Tucker Carlson should have known. Ah. It's not just that. It's the other thing that Tucker Carlson should have known is that two weeks ago, a inverted commas secret document supposedly written by the Rand Corporation mm -hmm. was leaked out. Rand, for those of you who don't know, yeah. is a major think tank specializing in strategy that is very closely connected to the US government. Yes. And there's a lot of movement of, of RAND personnel back and forth between the government and universities and things like that. Yes. It has been very influential for a long time. It has. And according to this secret document yes. so that supposedly exists, uh, they're even more influential than you might think. Ah. Because this secret document that was it somehow found itself on a Swedish website... <laughs> um, <laughs> it's a very, very, very small Swedish news website. Um, this was apparently, this top secret document was sent to the White House Chief of Staff, the National Security Advisor, the Department of State, the CIA, the NSA, and the Democratic National Committee of all, mm, of all places. Because of, of course they just send these documents to all, to the, just all, all together like that. Um, and what just, is, just to the public email addresses. Yeah, yeah, each yeah. Of these. yeah. And, what this, and what this document said, was it was a plan, a secret plan to help the Democrats win the next election by making Germany more dependent on America. Now, I don't know how that <laughs> works. I don't know how that works. How, how, how that translates to votes, I'm not sure. But either way, they were going to do this, make Germany more dependent on America by ginning up a war in Ukraine. This document was from supposedly January 2022. Let me quote the document. The only feasible way to guarantee Germany's rejection of Russian energy supplies is to involve both sides in the military conflict in Ukraine. Our further actions in this country will inevitably lead to a military response from Russia. Russians will obviously not be able to leave unanswered the massive Ukrainian army pressure on the unrecognized Donbas republics. That would make possible to declare Russia an aggressor and apply to it the entire package of sanctions beforehand. Sounds like mm. like perfect English, doesn't it? <laughs> anyway, um, uh, the, it goes I on. I just love the idea of an election being swayed on the all-important <laughs> issue of how dependent is Germany on America. Yeah, yeah. Now, um, now you might think that all sounds ridiculous. Uh, yes. I, I certainly do. Once again, I'm worried that we're even giving it credibility by but discussing it. What this and uh, But this document kind of turned up on this Swedish website. It was immediately... Uh, Elevated by by the Russian ambassador, by went on end up on a whole bunch of Russian TV stations, and like it, it was, it it is pretty clear that the the line of propaganda that is trying to be run at the moment is number one that America is the ones who started the war, mm. and number two, Russia just defend themselves, and number two, there's a there's an obvious propaganda effort at the moment to split the allies in the Ukrainian yes. war. It's particularly America from Europe. Mm. The, uh, the, and the, that, that is obvious. And Carlson should know that because that's not the only example of propaganda. There's a few of them out there, right? Mm. And so when Tucker Carlson runs with the line, the obvious propaganda line that the Russians would run, when he knows that Russia is trying to do exactly that right now for obvious reasons, mm. I think he should know better. That's what I think. I think that... I don't know who did it, 
but I do know what Russia, who Russia wants to think did it. That much I know. And for, for basic propaganda reasons. And so you shouldn't just spew obvious Russian propaganda unless you have good reason to, to think that it's true in this particular case. And Tucker Carlson had no reason because there's zero evidence. And this is not the first time he's done this. He has consistently been running with Russian propaganda for the entire Ukrainian war. I played, I've played a few examples on this podcast before where, I, where literally as they were being overrun... He was saying Russia were winning the war like about, t- about three weeks ago. I think you might be overestimating the relevance of truth <laughs> to Tucker Carlson. Well, look, yeah, maybe, may, may, maybe I am wasting time by treating him like a normal human being. <laughs> but I, but I, and, and by the way, let me, let me make clear as well. I'm yeah. not doing any sort of, you know, feverish Twitter thing where I go, oh, he's a Russian agent or where, mm-hmm. who's been paid. I'm not doing any of that shit. Mm. I'm just, all I'm saying is that Tucker Carlson is incredibly irresponsible. And if he, we, we, yeah. I, I get that he wants to run whatever lines so will seem a bit different and he wants to do paleo conservatism and all that. I, I get that. That's yeah. fine. But he needs to be aware that when he does this shit, it ends up on Russian TV. It ends up actually, he's talking, he's talking about how he's trying to stop World War Three. He is causing World War Three because he is helping Russia escalate the conflagration yeah, but, with their bullshit using him as a as a as a tool. But given that the business model of media is increasingly that it's not just about who's watching television, which is in decline, it's mm. about where is this clip going to end up mm. and how many people are going to watch it around the world across various platforms. Mm. Why wouldn't he be saying this? Well, he's getting lots of ra- ratings on Russian TV. That is true. Yeah, but he, I mean, he's uh, that propagation across multiple platforms is mm. the business model now. Yeah, maybe, maybe I'm not. Yeah. Look, I think a lot of this comes <laughs> down to, and this is my 100th episode book recommendation. Oh, 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 oh it's a big which one. Which I can't believe I haven't made before. It is no, Harry wait. Frankfurt's classic on bullshit. Okay. Right. So it's the distinction between lies and bullshit. Yeah. Frankfurt, who's a philosopher, I think he originally wrote this book in 1986 or this essay in 1986, but it was reissued around 2004, says that a lie actually pays some kind of tribute to the truth because mm-hmm. the liar recognizes the power of the truth and is deliberately uh is deliberately contradicting it for some purpose Mm. the bullshitter does not care about the truth value of what they are saying what they care about is the appearance uh produced by their bullshit so the for the the bullshitter the truth value is irrelevant if something they turn to say turns out to be true then they're fine with that uh if it turns out not to be true they're also fine with that the truth is completely irrelevant as opposed to the liar for whom the truth value is actually very important. It's important for them to negate it. Uh, Tucker Carlson is firmly in the realm of bullshit under this, uh, under this model. Yeah. 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 Okay. As you say, you don't have to go, you know, Russian agent, uh, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. No, he's just a bullshitter. Yeah. Yeah. He's definitely bullshitting. Uh, Yeah. Not very helpful. And he always has, but since since it's our hundredth anniversary, (laughs) let me share a reminiscence the first time I saw Tucker Carlson on TV. In a bow tie? In a, he was in a bow tie. <laughs> I haven't forgotten that, Tucker. I had just arrived in Michigan. This would have been in late August 2004. Mm. And in my delightful extended stay motel room, which I was staying before I could move into my apartment, I turned on CNN, mistakenly thinking that it would have something uh, edifying to offer. And it was this show called Crossfire. <laughs> which used to be on with Tucker yeah. Carlson arguing with Paul Begala. Yeah. Just the most massive waste of, of yeah. time in history. I think they shut that down after Jon Stewart had a yes. go. I thought that's where you were about to go. Uh, yeah, 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 Jon Stewart had a go at them. For hurting America. For hurting America. <laughs> yes. Jon Stewart in one of his wild swings between uh, aloofness and earnestness. L- little did he know what Tucker Carlson was going to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, yes, as you pointed out, back in those days, Tucker mm. Carlson wore a bow tie. I think mm. I might have told this anecdote before on Pep. But, okay, so this is one for the long-time mm. listeners then. Mm. Um, and both George W. Bush and John Kerry had been campaigning in Pennsylvania that week, and both of them had gone through the election campaign ritual of eating a Philly cheesesteak. 
uh, yes. one of Philadelphia's most famous delicacies. Mm. Now, you'd think this is a pretty simple thing, pretty hard thing to fuck up, but no, both of them managed to fuck it up. Okay. So John Kerry made the unforgivable faux pas of asking for his with Swiss cheese. Ah, oh. Yeah. It could only have been worse if it was French cheese. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so... He asked for it with Swiss cheese. That immediately, you know, makes him unelectable in the eyes of many people. Uh, George W. Bush, on the other hand, simply lied about ever having had one in the first place. Right. Yeah, he claimed he had one. He hadn't. Mm. So this leads to a lengthy debate between Tucker Carlson and Paul Begala (laughs) about which is worse, Kerry's elitism or Bush's lying. About cheese. Yes. Yes. And... Uh, yeah, that such was the elevated American political discourse yep. at the time. Yeah. But yeah, so Carlson in those days, he was this bow tie wearing kind of proudly elitist uh defender of George W. Bush. Mm. And there, he has since then gone through a very sort of typical ideological odyssey. He's he's had the station of Ron Paul mm. uh, at, at one point, and he's now sort of ended up at the station of just pure bullshit that ha- <laughs> happens to benefit Vladimir Putin. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and just before we move off, I just want to say one thing which yeah, I, what's I, that? about um, about Putin. Uh, if if he does have troubles, yes. like, and he's not looking great at the moment, the, uh, if he does have troubles and he does, and and for whatever reason, somewhere down the track, he ends up getting overthrown. Yeah. Right? There'd be a lot of Westerners at this point in time probably cheering for that, I would mm. have thought. The, uh, but I was reading a study mm. about this from uh, Barbara Geddes, amongst others. Mm-hmm. Barbara Geddes, excellent uh, comparative political scientist, one of the sort of, uh, really seminal figures in uh, comparative politics, professor yep. at UCLA. Yep. And what she noted is that since World War II, Less than 25% of autocratic breakdowns lead to democratic transitions. Mm -hmm. Over 75% lead to the perpetuation of the autocracy under a new leader. Yes. So I I often make the comparison to the wire. Yeah. When you get rid of one, you get 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 another one who's the same or worse. Yes. So Uh, just be aware of that. She would know. She is the expert on uh, regime types and likelihood of transitions. I've noticed now that some Western media outlets are beginning to pick up conspiratorial claims that have been circulating that Vladimir Putin is in fact very ill and oh, yeah. that all of this reflects his uh, illness. Sputnik actually had a Russian political scientist on to make this uh, to make this claim. Mm. And he was asked, well, what about the CIA director's assessment that in fact Putin is too healthy? This was made in February. Mm-hmm. And he said something like, Oh, that's just Anglo American sarcasm. They know what the real uh, they know what the real story is. But the only reason why I have mentioned this is not to actually make the claim that that Putin is sick. I have no idea whether he's sick or not. Uh, if he doesn't turn out to be sick, this would just fit very well into a long history of wishful thinking that's been uh, that's been going on about this, but no, I just want to segue into the greatest conspiracy theory of this week. Go for it. Which was that Xi Jinping was under house arrest. Oh, who would arrest and that him? A military coup had uh, taken place. Wow. Now this did not happen. No. No, Xi Jinping <laughs> appeared at an exhibition in uh, Beijing a couple mm-hmm. of days ago. Was he in handcuffs? Uh, no, he was no. not. <laughs> no, okay, he was on. not in handcuffs and no. he will still be attending the party congress on October 16th. In oh, fact, God. a list of attendees was released and his name was at the very top. Apparently, this rumour originated with... Because there had been a convoy of tanks, which someone in... Some organ of the Chinese government had tweeted out this picture of a convoy of tanks. This was then repurposed by uh, mischievous actors (laughs) as saying, "This is uh, this is a coup." Oh, okay. This is a coup in uh, in progress because tanks exist. There was also yeah uh, old footage from 2013 or 2014 (laughs) of explosions in the city of Tianjin. Yeah. Uh, well, sorry, I've mispronounced that, yeah. but yeah, sure. um, that that was also repurposed oh, okay. as uh, as saying there is a coup in progress. Just people but, aren't trying very hard anymore. No, they're, they're really were. not. 
while you're running hot, yes, uh, I know you want to talk about the electoral count act, which I was surprised by. That's usually the kind of thing I need to wedge mm. into this podcast. So <laughs> why don't why you go for it? Yeah. So the electoral count act, which actually looks pretty close to passage. At this yeah, point. yeah. At least yeah. the Senate version is. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there are eleven Republican senators yep. uh, 11. signed on to this now. And McConnell. Yes, yeah. there would still need to be reconciliation with the House version, yes. though, which yeah. I'm not. I'll talk you through the differences. Okay, in a yeah, second. yeah, yeah. You, you can yeah. Uh, you can talk us through the differences. There have been some amendments, which I think have been good amendments yep. to this, because in the original version of it, it would have given state governors a lot of power. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then I think they might have realised who some of the people running for uh, gubernatorial positions were and they decided instead to put a lot more ha- power in the hands of the courts. Yes. So this makes provisions for uh, judicial review of yep. uh, gubernatorial certification. It One of the most important things was it closed a loophole that would have allowed state legislatures to declare a failed election. Yep. It makes it very clear that the role of vice president is purely a ministerial one. That's right. That is all the only responsibility that they have is literally for opening the envelopes or however they So just to be clear, the Mike Pence situation could never happen again. Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Mike Pence does yes. not have the authority yes. to or, or Kamala, Kamala Harris would not yes. have the uh or mm. authority to mm. overturn it. So these are all important things. I can see why a lot of Republicans have signed onto it mm. because they do genuinely want to rule out uh, the kind of nonsense that we saw uh, on January sixth. Even one of the uh, one of the refusers actually signed on to this. Which one? I didn't know. Uh, the Mississippi senator whose name oh. escapes me. I'm not sure. I'll look it up later on. That's yeah. Fine. Anyway. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, Ted That's Cruz good. still hasn't. No, yeah. He said it was a bad law. It's about Donald Trump, he said. And you're right. It is about Donald Trump. If Donald Trump had yes, to pull the shit out of it. It is absolutely about Donald that Trump. That law would not be there. It is a, yeah. But in this case, I'm, I'm grateful for Donald Trump for yeah. pointing out a loophole in the law that can then yes. be closed. Uh, Josh yeah. Hawley, who has yeah. not committed one way or the other said, yet, said, this law has worked really well for 150 years. Until you came along, Yes, Josh. yeah, until <laughs> you came along, gave a raised fist gesture <laughs> to the crowd and tried to vote to overturn the election. Yeah. Even yeah. after being pursued through the halls of Congress by a raging mob. Yeah. <laughs> but I'll just be clear. We should just say why... Oh, should tell what the Electoral Count Act is. It's the law that governs what happens when election results are contested. Yes. And, and, and that's the one that Trump had his unique theory from John Eastman yes. about all this bullshit about, about and, alternative slates of electors being yes. sent from governors and Mike Pence deciding which one to pick, and etc. This, by the way, is an old law. It, I think that the origins of it were in the contested Tilden versus Hayes. 1876. Election in 1876. Yeah. Yeah. Where there, yeah, it was very disputed over who had actually won that election. The ultimate outcome of that was essentially that Republicans got to win uh, in exchange for withdrawing federal troops from the South. So that was Fair pretty trade. much the end of Reconstruction. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. Uh, now, uh, okay. The other thing I, which I think we should say before we get into brass tacks on this, although you've done a pretty good job going through most of them already. Oh, thank you, Chad. Is, um, the, uh, is, um, just remind you why we need electoral account act reform. Mm. Why we need to make it explicit? It's because, at least according to five three eight, sixty percent of American voters have an election truther on the ballot in twenty twenty two. Wow, sixty <laughs> percent. Right? How critical are those races? But they might just be in, yeah, you know, they might be in no hope of races. Mm. They're like you know, blue states or whatever. Um, well, Washington Post did a survey of the nineteen most closely watched statewide races and asked them if they would accept the outcome of the election. Mm. 18 of the 19 Democrats said they would accept the outcome. One did not respond. Mm. Uh, Seven of the 19 GOP nominees committed to accepting the outcomes. 12 either refused to commit or declined to respond. And I assume they gave them more than an hour to respond. I assume they had proper time. Uh, Worst of all, though, those numbers were pretty dire, but even worse was this quote, Mm. which I was quite taken aback by. An aide to one Republican nominee insisted the candidate would accept this year's results, but the aide declined to be publicly identified saying so. Wow. Now, when you get to that point, you know there is actual pressure 
Yes. To to be a truther on elections. Yeah. Like there's actual political pressure and that's not a great incentive to have. It's really not. Yeah, so that, that's a bit of a concern. And by the way, I get a load of this quote from probably the person who's most likely out of the truthers to get to get to win an election, which is Arizona Secretary of State candidate Mark Fincham. Mm. He's doing pretty well at the moment. He's not miles ahead, but mm. you know, but he's 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 on the, the positive side of fifty fifty. He was asked by Time magazine. Uh, if Biden wins Arizona in 2024, would he certify that result as Secretary of State? Mm. And this is what he said. This is while he's running. This yes. is while he's running. He's on his best behavior. He said, if the law is followed and legitimate votes have been counted and Joe Biden ends up being the winner, I'm required under the law, if there's no fraud, to certify the election. But I think you're proposing something that, quite frankly, is a fantasy. Why, I asked him, was it so impossible to believe that Biden won in Arizona as many polls predicted and post-election reviews confirmed? He said, it strains credibility. Isn't it interesting that I can, can't find anyone who'll admit that they voted for Joe oh Biden? God. Was it possible that lots of people I don't personally know have voted for Biden? In a fantasy world, anything's possible, he said. Amazing. So that guy could be Secretary of State in Arizona. That's why you need a law. Yes. Right. <laughs> okay. At least a clarification of the law. All right. So uh, Dave's been through most of this in terms of the, the actual details. I'm going to just talk about some of the differences mm -hmm. between the House and the Senate version. Um, like Dave said, both bills deal with the VP. Both bills um, say that only a governor or a top state official can submit states of electors. Mm -hmm. You can have these mystery alternative states, slates of electors turning yep. up. Uh, both bills, as you say, create an, an, ex, an expedited judicial review mm -hmm. if the governor does something dodgy. Like, like you can challenge the, the, the governor's certification. Both bills, and that's in court I'm talking about, both bills stop, this is an important one, stop states from changing election laws after the election, mm. which a number, number of states have tried. Yes. <laughs> so, um, now, the Senate bill increases the threshold for objections mm -hmm. in the chamber from one person, like only one person needs to object to have, to have, have, a, have a proper vote on this, yep. uh, to a third of the chamber. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, uh, the, sorry, that's the House bill is a third of the chamber. The yep. Senate bill is a fifth of the chamber. Yep. They both increase it. Um, the, uh, the House bill has an extra protection though. Mm -hmm. They are only allowed to challenge on things that are specifically mentioned in the constitution. Right. So like the age of yep. the candidate or the number of electors or something ah, like that. Okay. So that, so the House actually limits what they can object to. On the grounds on which they can object, the Senate does not. Mm -hmm. The Senate just says you need a fifth of the, the chamber to have mm -hmm. an objection. The House bill defines exactly what events can prolong a voting period. Like, right. for instance, a natural disaster or terrorism or something like that, you can have a longer voting period in an election. The Senate bill is silent about that. Now, that wasn't an issue in this particular election, but mm -hmm. they're just trying to think creatively, yep. <laughs> try to anticipate the next thing. Um, the House bill stipulates if a governor refuses to, this is what you were talking about, to submit a proper state of electors, mm -hmm. the courts can designate a different state official to do so. So yes. they can work around the recalcitrant mm -hmm. governor yep. situation you just said. Senate does not do that. And the House imposes, this is the one I'm not so sure about. Mm. The House imposes a big penalty on candidates who file lawsuits to challenge the election results without a good faith basis. Right. That to me... That feels like it's getting to a dodgy area, like it's a real subjective kind of punishing your opponent kind of area myself. But um, others might disagree. I mean, I know who it's, who it's aimed at. Uh, yes. <laughs> so yeah, the, uh, yeah. But um, anyway, but the, apart from that, they do basically the same thing. Hmm. So the, now in, in terms of whether it's going to be a House bill or a Senate bill, it's not going to be the House bill because only nine Republicans supported it in the House hmm. and those nine happened to be the nine Republicans who are not coming back yes. after 2022. So the chance of them getting 10 Republicans in the Senate to support hmm. the House bill is very unlikely. Yep. Um, the Senate, as you say, already has the numbers. Yes. So my suspicion is it's going to be the Senate bill to get through and that's fine. Um uh, I'll kind of just say a really depressing poll I saw from Morning Consult on this topic, which is exactly why you just need to press uh, pass this bloody bill right now. As mm. soon as possible, please pass this bill. 52% of people mm. said it should be harder for Congress to override presidential election results. So it should be harder. They say, like I said, 48% of people saying it's okay for Congress to override presidential election results. 53% say it should be more difficult for state governments to override presidential election results. Now, you might be thinking, oh, those bloody Republicans. 
66% of Democrats said it should be harder for Congress to override presidential wow. results. 60, 65% of Democrats said it should be more difficult for state governments to override. Independents were 45% and 42% saying it should be harder. Yeah. Um, Republicans were 42% and 41%. So they actually were all quite close together. But the fact is, a lot of people don't give us stuff. Now, no. maybe they don't understand. Maybe this is the kind of thing where they just get confused when they get asked the question. They don't fully understand the legal side. Mm. I can believe that. But the fact is, you're not getting pressure from those people yeah. who don't give us stuff or don't understand, right? So what I'm saying is if you don't take advantage of this window, mm. it's going to disappear and they are not going to close this loophole. Mm. So do it now. Whatever you need to do, yes. <laughs> do it now as soon as possible. And I think they will. Because mm. Mitch McConnell is a good person to have on side Yes, <laughs> um, for this kind of stuff. He gets stuff done. So, um, yeah, I think that uh, I think this will happen. So, anyway, that's our, that's our count out. Yeah. Um, you want to talk about Hurricane Ian? Actually, I don't have very much to say no? because okay. I thought that there would be a lot of information available by today, but there isn't. There's, There's just okay, too, much, too much chaos. So, we can talk about that next week. Fine by me. Okay. Uh, well, then, in that case, let me instead do a stats nugget. This um, this stats nugget falls under the dog that hasn't barked. Right. Um, I, I haven't heard much talk about progressives in the midterms. Like, you know, like challenges from the progressive left of of incumbents and moderates and all that kind of stuff. You remember in 2020, there was a lot of talk of you know, yeah. panicking Democrats, moderate Democrats going, oh no, Bernie Sanders is taking over. Yeah, yeah. And like, there's a lot of that kind of stuff. Well, let me to give you the numbers because mm. the primaries are over now. Yes. 11 candidates endorsed by at least one major progressive organization or high profile progressive figure mm -hmm. tried to top, topple incumbents this year. Right. One succeeded. It was Jamie McLeod Skinner beating Kurt Schrader. Now, back in 2020, mm -hmm. it was three succeeded out of 17. Yep. So the numbers are uh, smaller. Not, it's not, you know, it's not yeah. massive, but they're smaller. But the, that's the less interesting one. The interesting one is open races mm -hmm. because it's hard to topple an incumbent. Yes. Open races, you need significantly less money yep. and there's significantly less resistance mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. In 2020, 22 out of 32 progressive back candidates won open contests right. in primaries. So that's 69%. Yep. 22 out of 32. This year, it was 14 out of 25 open contests. So right. that's 56%. Now, yep. Um, now, this is only, we're, we're talking a very small sample here, mm. okay? So, we'll see what happens in 2024. Yeah. Maybe there's a midterms effect here, like where people care less about midterms. Yeah. Maybe, I don't know. Um, the uh, And it's not like it, it, there's a massive, these are massive movements either. No, no. Like, but But just, it's... If there was a if if there was momentum happening in twenty twenty, it subsided somewhat in twenty twenty two. Um, do you have any theories about that or look, even if it is a smaller number, it'll still be enough for centrist Democrats to blame <laughs> uh progressives for losing the house. Yeah, I'm sure that will be that would be the case. Um uh I should say as well, by the way, even with, on those numbers, if you keep on doing that every single election for yeah. for a number of years you will mm. take over the party anyway eventually you just take, yes, yeah, just yeah. take 20 years to do it yeah. <laughs> but, um, but anyway just uh, just uh, just since no one ever talks about this anymore i just i just saw those numbers like, that's interesting making making a nugget all right this is the time when uh if you're not interested in in detail it's time to get a cup of milo because this is <laughs> my uh, time to shine um i want to talk about the inflation reduction act dave okay <laughs> it's uh this is, uh, now for those who, this is going to go on for a little while, but, but please Dave, jump in because otherwise I'm going to be talking. If you, if you have anything to say, jump in at any point in time. Okay. okay. This is, for those who don't even know what the Inflation Reduction Act was, this happened while we were away. This happened a few months back. It was the husk of the Build Back Better bill. If you recall, that was Biden's first big bill where he was going to have everything. It was like with the free pre-K and the free childcare and all this kind of stuff. Uh, heaps of goodies and mansion and cinema just stripped it like locusts. <laughs> they, they, just, they just fed on it, right? And it looked like it was dead. It looked like there was nothing. Going, but 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 Schumer negotiated with Mansion and a few other negotiations, and, they, and Biden jumped in there for, for a little while as well. And they finally got something, right? Let me go through what they got. All right, so it was a seven hundred and forty billion dollar bill in total. Not a super popular bill, I must say. No. 
Uh, according to New York Times, 36% of voters said they approve of the Inflation Reduction <laughs> Act. Part of the problem is not a lot of people, there's not a lot of info out there. Just after it passed, CBS had a poll. This is literally the week after it was signed into law. They found 34% of registered voters said they'd heard or read a lot about the, the law. Mm. And over and New York Times found over a quarter said they hadn't heard about it at all. Yeah. So this is why I'm addressing it right now. You won't be, you will be in the 34%, Peppers. This is my promise to you. Uh, okay, what's in it? Let's start with inflation, given it's the Inflation Reduction Act. Yes. Okay. Now, Biden claimed, quote, the bill was the single most important legislation passed in the Congress to combat inflation and one of the most significant laws in our nation's history. Don't know about that. <laughs> it uh, supposedly reduces the debt by $305 billion over 10 years. Mm -hmm. By contrast, the truth, um, <laughs> the Wharton School of Business conclude the bill's impact on inflation will be statistically indistinguishable from zero. CBO says its effect will be negligible. The numbers are completely dodgy. Let me just go through this briefly for you. 93% of inverted commas savings are in the last five years of the 10-year window, which means we are not going to see them because obviously in five years' time, <laughs> we will have other legislation in the meantime. And they're imaginary savings anyway. Only three years of Obamacare subsidy expansion was paid for in the 10-year bill. Mm. All right? That alone would send it into deficit. In fact, according to CBO, if they'd done the full, the full 10 years, it would have cost $180 billion more. Mm. Okay, so that in itself is just complete bullshit. There, there goes most of your Invercom surplus straight away. Secondly... This is the biggest dodge of all. I can't believe this. And this is hard to explain, so bear with me, but you will agree this is really, really dodgy. And this tells you all you need to know about why politics sucks in America. Pharmacy benefit managers. You may not have heard of them. You probably haven't. They're basically middlemen in the American healthcare system. I'm not going to go into detail because it will bore you. But all you need to know is that drug companies reckon cutting these guys out of the process would save money. Mm. Right? But the CBO budget boffins actually found that they're so embedded in the system, it would actually cost Medicaid more money to get rid of these guys, right. these leeches, right? And uh, so that's the situation, right? In 2019, someone convinced Trump to kill them off anyway, probably a drug company, I imagine. Mm -hmm. right? yeah, and Trump kind of didn't care. He just said, yeah, whatever. Like he, like he, 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 he passed it, but just didn't really give a stuff. And it just crawled along in the background. And it was the rule was finalized in January 2021, at which point in time Trump had other concerns, like like Mike Pence. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but no one liked the rule in the Biden administration because they understood what they were doing and it made no sense. And so they just didn't implement it. So when they passed the infrastructure bill, they said, what we'll do is we'll put off the implementation of the pharmaceutical benefits management rule until 2026. We'll put it off for five years and we'll pocket the savings that the CBO said would would, uh. would, 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 uh, would come to true. So they, they uh, added $50 billion in savings by putting it off till 2026, this imaginary rule, which was never going to be implemented. That's some damn fine accounting. <laughs> and, so, and now they've done it again. In the IRA, they've put it off to 2032 and netted $122 billion of savings. So... There goes all your savings between the Obamacare three years instead of 10 years and the pharmaceutical benefits management bullshit. All phony money, all imaginary savings, 100%. So that is one of the reasons why it will make no impact on inflation. The other is that it's not designed to anyone. No. It, <laughs> it's, it does everything but inflation. It was, was it Joe Manchin's idea? Yeah, to call it was Joe it Manchin's The Inflation idea. Reduction Act, yeah. It's got yeah. nothing to do with inflation. Yeah. It was yeah. never designed. <laughs> As Chaz said... It's the scaled back version of Build Back Better, yeah. which was devised before inflation became a major issue. Exactly. So what does it do? Let's look at what it actually does. Healthcare. $64 billion to extend subsidies for private health insurance for the 13 million people on the Obamacare exchanges. Uh -huh. They're the ones who buy private health insurance through the Obamacare exchanges. Um, that's, that, as I said, only lasts three years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, uh, it caps Medicare seniors out of pocket drug costs at two thousand dollars annually yep. from twenty twenty five. So no matter so they cannot pay more than two thousand dollars for drug costs, which is that's welcome, I imagine, for seniors. It allows Medicare to negotiate drug prices a little bit 
Mm. Now, this is a big thing because Medicare accounts for more than a third of the country's total drug spending. Yes. So when you say negotiating, it's negotiating down the barrel of a gun, essentially. And uh, But when I say a little bit, what I mean is they can only negotiate the prices of 10 extra drugs every year Yeah. out of the 100 drugs that cost Medicare the most money. Yes. So what that means is those little boutique drugs yep. that are for special diseases that cost trillions of dollars, the, the, the mm. Martin, what's his name? Shrek. Shkreli? Yeah, yeah, like that kind of situation. It wouldn't affect him Yeah, because he had a very special drug. Just for those of you who are not aware, by the way, like what is this insanity of Medicare not being able to negotiate over drug prices? Yeah. Because in every country that has an actual single-payer scheme or even a sort of semi-single-payer scheme, the government negotiates over drug prices and that brings the price down significantly because they have the monopsony power. Mm. This is one of the major points of actually having single payer in the first place. Yep. This is one of the reasons why the US spends, you know, twice as much on healthcare as other advanced industrial democracies while getting worse results. Uh, so why is it that prior to this, Medicare hasn't been able to negotiate at all? This, I believe, was because of the Medicare Part D legislation. This is, this is under Bush. This is under George yeah. W. Bush, yeah. which was an expansion of the number of drugs that were covered by mm -hmm. Medicare. But the price that was exacted for this by the pharmaceutical industry was that the government would not be able to negotiate yeah. over that price. That mm -hmm. was the bargain. Now, every healthcare system in the world involves some kind of political bargain in order to placate the healthcare industry, mm. right? It absolutely has to in all parts of it, whether that's doctors, pharmaceutical companies or whatever. Um, in Australia, for example, the basic bargain is that our version of Medicare covers all of the essential stuff, uh, but it's the, the rest is left to private health insurance, mm. dental and optical and, uh, and things like that. So Australians have very high levels of private health insurance coverage despite the fact that we have Medicare. So everybody you know, has to engage in some kind of bargain at some point. Uh, the flavour of healthcare that you get in a country often depends on when did the bargain come into existence. So the NHS, for example... Uh, in Britain, which is one of the more expansive uh, single-payer systems. Why was that able to happen? It's because it came into existence right after the Second World War. Mm. And in the words of one of the members of the Labor government who put that through when they were asked, well, didn't doctors protest? He said, we stuffed their mouths with gold. <laughs> because at that point, really, only the government had the money yeah. uh, to, uh, yeah, mm. to, to pay doctors. So mm. the fact that the NHS was able to come into existence then is why it continues to be such an expansive system and has survived that, despite the fact that since then, conservative governments have been in power something like two-thirds of the time. Yeah. So, But what you've got in the US is a bargain that is incredibly tilted towards the pharmaceutical industry, and that's mm -hmm. because of the fact that the United, uh, you know, the US hasn't had uh, any real version of single-payer healthcare, even though Democrats have been pushing for it um, since the 1930s. So the, given the status quo is always so in favour of uh, the medical industry, it means that any bargain that you get is always going to be heavily tilted towards them. Yes. Well, in this case, they, they're only chipping away at it because, as I said, only 10 extra drugs every year they can negotiate are the 100 drugs that cost Medicare the most money. The, there's also exceptions for drugs that have generic competition mm -hmm. or drugs that are less than nine years old. So there's only so many drugs that can do that. Yeah. But anyway, um, it, they would also... That's the drugs that were invented less than nine years ago. Not, yes. not drug, oh, yeah. <laughs> drugs that have been in your medicine cabinet. <laughs> but I think I've got some of them. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, that would also require pharmaceutical companies to rebate Medicare if they raise the price of drugs faster than the rate of inflation, mm. which is an interesting little reform. Interesting. I'll be interested to see how that goes. And there's a $36, $35 per month price cap on insulin. So that's what they're doing for healthcare. Yes. Taxes. There's a 1% tax on companies that buy back their own stock. They've been talking about that for a while. Yeah. There's a uh, 50. So do you want to say something about that? No? Well, yeah. I would just note mm. that a, a large part of the recovery from the global financial crisis of the stock market mm. 
which w- while the rest of the country and the rest of the world took so long to recover, a lot of that was stock buybacks. Mm. Yeah. So yeah. stock buybacks really be- kind of became a symbol of uh, entrenched inequality. And now they're taxing it. Yes. 1%. And a 15%, <laughs> staying somewhere, and a 15% minimum tax on companies making more than a billion dollars. So when you hear about, about you know, Amazon playing zero or something like that. Yeah. I mean, there's going to be, I think that's, I still think that's after deductions. Yes. So there'll still be companies paying zero. Yeah. But fewer, fewer of countries, <laughs> companies paying zero. Yes. Uh, and, and, and Kirsten Cinema managed to get an exemption for businesses owned by private equity companies in that minimum tax. <laughs> I don't know how she, 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 Honestly, she's a cancer. Honestly, uh, we'll talk about her another time. Those plucky <laughs> little heroes of the people. <laughs> what she do? I don't understand what she's doing. Like, I get moderate. Like, I understand moderate. Yeah. I'm a moderate. I get that. I don't get the stuff that she backs. It's it's. She makes absolutely no effort to put a fig leaf. On no, this, she doesn't. On, on this no, she stuff. doesn't. Anyway. Yeah. Anyway. Um. Yeah. And also, she insisted on them keeping the hedge fund companies' tax loophole open as well. <laughs> They were going to close that one, but no. Uh, and the reason why she counts so much is they need every single Democrat for this one. Yes. Okay. The, the, then also with taxes, the IRS tax agents have gotten more funding, $80 billion for the IRS. Yes. There's good reasons for that. At the moment, the IRS has been starved of resources to go after rich people for decades. Um, obviously, rich people are good at hiding their tax evasion. And they, and they'll challenge you in court, so mm. you need money to take them on. And the IRS has been deprived of money. So the IRS have learned to go after low-hanging fruit instead, which is poor people. Mm. Uh, In 2010, according to the Government Accountability Office, 21% of tax returns reporting over $10 million in income were audited in 2010, 21%. In 2019, it was 3.9%. Uh, just uh, just across nine years. Uh, amongst those making between $5 million and $10 million, audits fell from 13.5% to 1.4%. Mm. By contrast, more than half of the agency's audits in 2021 were directed at taxpayers with incomes less than $75,000 and men- more than 40% of its audits targeted recipients of the earned income tax credit, which is an anti-poverty measure. Yes. So that's kind of shit. Uh, okay, so they're funding 87,000 more staff over a yes. decade. There are currently 81,000 IRS staff, so that's theoretically yeah. more than doubling, but it's projected with retirements and restructuring, the bill's actually going to end up seeing 117,000 employees in a decade. So from 81,000 yes. up to 117,000. Now, this is the first thing that House Republicans have said they're going after. Oh, they don't like If that. they get the majority. Yeah. Retrenching the 87,000 IRS yes. agents. Yes, yes. Um, it is very easy to turn, yeah, lack of enforcement of tax laws into a populist crusade. Mm, yeah. yeah, the yeah. IRS is a deeply unpopular institution. Um, uh, th- yeah, there's... well, actually, sorry, I don't interrupt you much, but I'm going to interrupt you on that one. Yeah, because I can know what's coming. Pupil. Yes. IRS. This is a couple of weeks ago. Sixty-five percent favorability. Really. Twenty-nine percent. Okay, I did not expect that. I didn't expect either. That's why I wrote it down. That is not the boogeyman that we are all led to believe. We hear, we internalize that kind of talk. Ah. And so we assume it is a boogeyman because we just keep on hearing people going, IRS, IRS, but pew. Anyway, that keep is, on going. That is very high yeah. compared to other institutions of government. Yeah, it's not bad. Of government. Yeah. 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 That, I, I imagine that would be behind the military, but uh, yes. that's, <laughs> yes. yeah, that's pretty high. But... Uh, it, the yes, fact, the fact is everyone everyone thinks it's yes. a liability, and so it's easy to yep. to to turn to a populist cause, as you say. Yes, so, yeah. yeah, that's it. Okay, all right. So <laughs> I just ruined your point. Sorry. Yeah, um, yeah you did. <laughs> Thanks, Chaz. <laughs> Happy one hundredth episode to you too. <laughs> well, look, you're certainly right that they're 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 running a scare campaign. Yeah. In, in particular, what they what they've been doing a lot of is eighty seven thousand armed agents. Armed agents to make them sound scarier. Now they are uh, like it's yeah. like Biden's goons. Yeah. You know? Um. First of all, I don't know when having guns became bad. <sighs> Conservatives. <laughs> But anyway, um, it's also bullshit. Uh, only a small number of criminal investigation agents mm. get guns. Uh, there's, right now, it's 2,100 agents out of the 81,000. Mm. So I suspect it's not 87,000 
armed agents. <laughs> Maybe there might be another one or two thousand. Um, what they coin the treasury, and I must admit, I find this a little confusing what I'm about to say. Yeah. But I'm just going to read you what they've said. Of the new of the net new hires, the majority are hired to improve customer services, from upgrading IT to answering phone calls. Uh, they say only 6,500 of the new hires will actually be agents, mm. which seems to defeat the purpose of why they're there really for. Does, but yeah. anyway, anyway, let's leave that aside. This is what I don't understand. Given what I just told you, yeah. the majority are hired to improve customer services. CRS says out of the $80 billion, $45 billion is for, quote, enforcement activities. Mm. $25 billion for operations support. $4.8 billion for business systems modernization and only $3.2 billion to improve taxpayer services. So I don't know how you can reconcile those two sets of numbers. I don't know. I'm just giving you the numbers. I report, you decide. Um, it's weird to me. Uh, Janet Yellen insists that the uh, Treasury Secretary insists that the IRS will not increase audits proportionately for people earning less than four hundred thousand okay. dollars, proportionately, he's doing some heavy lifting yes. there because there's going to be <laughs> there's going to be more tax audits happening. Um, but anyway, so that, 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 that that's what that, that's what's going on there. I actually, I mean, I I hope for the reasons I've just told you that, that the Republicans don't win on this, but I suspect they will. Mm. At, at least at least in terms of um, the old cut. Cut by a thousand. Death by a thousand cuts. Death by a thousand cuts, yeah, I suspect. This is what they did before. I yes. imagine they'll do it again. Yeah. Let's talk about the environment now, because this is what actually the bill is mostly about. Yes. Uh, America definitely needs help here. Um, <laughs> Bloomberg, according to Bloomberg, public and private spending on the energy transition is was $114 billion in America last year. Mm -hmm. It was $266 billion in China, just as a point of comparison. Yep. Uh, the bill has about $370 billion in spending for the environment. Okay. According to Rhodium Group, the IRA will cut U.S. net greenhouse gas emissions by 31 to 44 percent below 2005 levels in 2030, which will get USA two thirds of the way to their target of 50 to 52 percent reduction by 2030. Now that sounds great. Mm. You got to look at the numbers carefully, though, mm. because the baseline was 24 to 35 percent. Right. Under current policy if they do nothing so realistically it's cutting emissions by nine percent over where they would have ended up in 2030 yeah and that's also dependent on certain conditions which i'm going to get to okay <laughs> <laughs> sorry guys there's a reason i'm such a pessimist about the environment uh methane it uh it it spends a hundred one point one and a half billion dollars rewarding companies who reduce their methane emissions that's mm -hmm. the carrot and the stick is a fee of $1,500 per tonne of methane leaking from oil and natural gas facilities. That fee will increase over time. That's a good thing because methane is a powerful, a potent greenhouse gas. Agriculture. The, uh, agriculture is responsible for 74% of American nitrous oxide emissions from fertilizer. $20 billion is spent in the agricultural sector to hopefully see a 30% cut of nitrous oxide emissions by 2030. Energy efficiency. There's $9 billion in credits, rebates, and investments for buildings and for building new electric and energy efficient homes and replacing fossil fuel reliant systems in existing homes with electric equivalents. They target low income households in particular, which is a good thing because they obviously are not going to be able to afford to do it themselves. A mm. uh, billion dollars for public housing and energy e efficiency as well. Not sure this is going to work, a billion dollars, because solar panels, for instance, cost $11,000 to set up. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. I'm not sure a, a tax rate is going to cut it, but anyway, it's there. Environmental justice, $60 billion for environmental justice, whatever the hell that means, I'm never quite sure. $15 billion of that is for cleaning up low-income and disadvantaged communities. $3 billion for grants to clean up abandoned mines, monitor air quality, and improve weather resilience. Well, I'd say that you do understand what it means, then. Well, I understand those bits. I don't, yeah, understand, yeah. The, I don't understand what the other 40, 41... Is environmental is degradation like. exacerbates inequality. Yeah. So this is targeting the parts of environmental degradation that particularly exacerbate inequality. That's fine. I just like to see the detail. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's, um, <laughs> that people throw the phrase environmental justice around a lot these days, and it always makes me a little bit confused. <laughs> Renewable energy. America has a massive problem with re re renewable energy. Let me tell you what it is. Right now... The top wind and solar developers plan to build a collective 92,000 megawatts of capacity in the U.S. through 2026. Uh, that would be 8% of total capacity in 2021. Right. What they intend to build over the next five years. Yeah. Okay? In 2021, renewables are 27% of total electri electricity generation capacity. Mm -hmm. So by 2026, that would be 35% of all renewable energy replaced if 
renewable energy replaced non-renewable energy and demand didn't increase. Mm. Of course, demand is going to increase. Yes. And of course, they'll be replacing old renewable energy as well. Right. Under those trends, it would take until 2067 to create a zero emission grid, even if we assume there's no increase in demand and there's no replacement of old renewable energy. Right. Okay. So they need to accelerate significantly yeah. from yes. where they're at. Okay. Um, and demand's going to skyrocket. According to the Department of Energy, simply adding electric vehicles onto the grid alone mm. is going to increase demand by a third. Right. So that's a lot of increased capacity. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what they what are they going to do? Ninety eight billion dollars in renewable energy tax credits is what they're going to do. That's that's pretty sizable. It's basically continuing the tax credit for for new renewable energy projects that already exist. Mm -hmm but only if projects meet certain wage and apprenticeship requirements, e.g. union labor. Mm. $27 billion to create a national green bank to leverage private investment. Mm -hmm. Sounds like sound, that sounds useful. $3 billion in new loan authorities uh, for the advanced technology vehicle manufacturing loan aimed at the auto industry in particular. This is electric mm. vehicles we're on now. Big tax credit for electric vehicles. Currently, new electric vehicles get a rebate of $7,500 each but it's limited to 200,000 rebates per manufacturer. GM and Tesla have already hit their cap. Mm. So there's no more rebates for, for either of them. This will remove the cap and it will also add $4,000 extra tax credit, or a $4,000 tax credit for used electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. But, but, is a big but. That's a Sir Mix-a-Lot sized but. Small vehicles need to be less than 55,000. Big vehicles need to be less than 80,000. 40% of the components of cars need to be made in the US or in a US free trade partner to qualify for the rebate in 2024. Uh. That includes where the minerals for the batteries come from. Right, which is probably not going to be the US oh, in it's most not. cases. Oh, it's not. Only 21 of the 72 electric vehicles available in the US are eligible for the rebate through the end of this year. All right? Mm. Now, obviously, or hopefully it will change. But then it gets harder. That's the, the start. Mm -hmm. The year after, they ramp it up by 10%. And they keep on ramping up by 10% until they get to 80% requirements by 2027. By 2024, any uh, cars featuring any battery components made or assembled by a foreign entity of concern, in other words, China, mm. are going to be ineligible for the credit. Okay. By 2025, batteries must exclude minerals like lithium or cobalt that come from those countries, i.e. China. China controls 73% of the world's, co world's cobalt, 88% of its nickel, and 59% of its lithium. Sorry, 68% of nickel, that was, mm -hmm. and 59% of lithium. All of them are essential components of electric vehicle batteries right now. Yes. China produces 76% of the world's electric vehicle batteries. America produces 8%. Most projection, projections suggest America and Europe combined will only account for about a quarter of electric vehicle relevant min minerals by 2030. Mm. You can't bring those minerals out of thin air, unfortunately. No. That could be good for Australia. We tie with Indonesia for having the world's largest nickel reserves. Ah. So there you go. There but, you go. But how about cobalt? And how about <laughs> lithium? Yeah. <laughs> Another. Well, you can't win them all. So what... I'm not sure that they're going to be using all those tax credits, essentially, mm. and which means ele electric vehicles are going because given that given the 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 rebate already exists, are going to become more expensive yes. under this bill yep. than they than they would have been otherwise. Um, another real issue is how you generate the amount of electricity you need for these vehicles, like I said before, and we see a case study in, in the UK right now where they currently pay 18 pence per mile for electricity charging at public charging stations. Mm -hmm. Bear in mind they pay nine pence per mile at home. Yes. But at public charging stations, 18 pence per mile, and they pay 19 pence per mile for gasoline. Mm. So so basically charging an electric car costs the same amount as a petrol car in England right yes. now. At a public station. I emphasize at a public station. If you do it at home, it's cheaper. Mm. But anyway, but I mean, that's just an indication of you need to watch your electricity distribution. Yes. Because this all falls apart mm -hmm. if electricity becomes too expensive, yep. right? And all that came with a price. Mm -hmm. That's what they do. But yep. thanks to Mansion, 
it reinstates $192 million in rejected Gulf of Mexico oil and gas leases that were blocked by a court ruling. Yes. It requires two more sales in the Gulf and one in Alaska before October 2023. Interior has to offer at least 60 million acres of offshore parcels and 2 million acres onshore during the prior year before it can approve any renewable energy leases. Having said that, according to Energy Innovation, the impact on overall pollution outweighs the emissions generated by the pro-fossil fuel pieces by about 24 to 1. So, the, so it's still environmentally friendly, but man, mansion. Okay. Um, uh, so that's, that's essentially, essentially what the bill says, the IRA. And then that takes us to this week, which yep. is the permitting stuff. Oh, can I just quickly mention two other environmental things? That are, are yes, of course you can, Jess. <laughs> it's our 100th episode. That's true. It's got nothing to do with the, the IRA, but just when we're talking about the environment. By the way, when Chaz keeps saying IRA, inflation reduction. Yes, act. this is not a Republican army. Yeah. Um, the, the biggest news, actually, was unadulterated environmentally good news, was the California Air Resources Board last month hmm. required that 35% of their new vehicles sold in 2026 be emission free. Okay. Which is, yeah, so, and 68% of their new cars need to be emission free by 2030, and all new cars sold in California by 2035 be emission free. Wow. California is so big, that's going to affect the whole of America. Yes, that, will. Is, that is effectively California ruling that the whole of America is going to have emission free cars by 2035, yes. regardless of what the IRA yeah. suggests. Um, note their new cars. Yeah. So people, there'll probably be a pretty good market in used cars. Yes. I imagine at that point in time. Um, uh, no, but that's a big haul to be able mm. to do that because only right now only 560,000 of the 14 million registered vehicles in California are electric vehicles. Mm. And, um, and also California controls the laws surprisingly in Washington, Massachusetts and Virginia. Mm. So they're all the same. Yes. Because they've all, they've just got this deal going. Um, Virginia's, Virginia's trying to get that out of that. And the young can know. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, basically 15% of the total light, light duty vehicle sales in America are, are covered by that, yep. by that regulation. That's a big deal. That is a big deal. Uh, another big deal is something the Senate just ratified this week, which is the Kigali Amendment, which I bet you haven't heard of because I hadn't heard of it until I read this. I don't think anyone's Kigali heard of it. Kigali as in the capital of Rwanda. Yeah, that's right. No, I had not heard yeah. of the Kigali no, Amendment. No one's heard of it. It's the offspring of the Montreal Protocol from the 80s. Remember the Montreal Protocol to get rid of CFCs for the ozone layer? Oh, yes. They kept on going. They kept on, they okay, kept, they kept right. on making amendments. Yep. To, right? And this treaty will phase out the world's use of hydrofluorocarbons. Okay. Right? The, uh, which, which are used as an industrial refrigerant and in sprayable consumer products. Okay. Uh, it'll save about half a degree. Celsius of global warming. That's significant. Yeah, that's pretty big. Yeah, like that. That that's probably better than this bloody IRA is going to do, <laughs> and it's got no publicity whatsoever. And it was passed by twenty-one Republicans and forty-eight Democrats in the Senate. It was ratified properly. Now you might go, how the hell did this happen? <laughs> What's going on here? <laughs> and it's uh, one hundred thirty-seven countries have already ratified it. By the way, it's going to happen. It's it's going to like it's, okay, it's yeah. good news. So I had never heard of this. The reason you haven't heard of it is because America is already abiding by it. So it's not controversial. In December 2020, Congress passed, passed targets as part of the COVID stimulus bill. Why did co the Republicans agree to do this? It's because industry wanted it to happen. And yeah, the reason why is because America makes the replacement chemicals. Ah. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> but it's interesting how all the ideological and principled arguments yes. that you hear against treaties and against global warming regulation just melt away when America makes a profit out of them. That's Isn't that right. funny? Like Greenlandic <laughs> shelf ice. Yes. Okay. Anyway, but anyway, Kigali that's, that's Amendment. Still, but that's, still a big deal. That's great. So yes. there you go. Yeah. Let's talk about this week. Permitting reform. Yeah. Do you know, do you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Do you have any idea? No. Okay. All right. Okay. I can just see that you look very excited. This is getting closer and closer to relevance. <laughs> this is attached to the government that could shutdown. could be our motto. Closer and closer to relevance. 100 episodes of Pep getting closer and closer to relevance. I'm going to write that down. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, okay. So this is, getting, this is getting very close to relevance because, hang in there, guys. Because when Schumer did, did the deal with Manchin for the IRA, yeah, yeah. the Inflation Reduction Act, he carved out the most problematic bits to get it over the line. Right. So they could sneak it through, right? And he said he'd include them in must-pass legislation later on. Yeah. Later on was this week. The must-pass legislation was the shutdown bill. Right. They had to keep the government open because they need to keep the, they need to pass a continuing resolution by today yep. in order to keep the government open and not have a shutdown. 
And what we're talking about is the very exciting sounding permitting reform. <laughs> Let me give you a quick background. According to Princeton University's repeat project, the Inflation Reduction Act has the potential to secure, like I said, two-thirds of the emission reductions the United States needs to meet their 2030 targets, ignoring the fact they were most of the way there anyway. But 80% of the IRA's potential emissions reductions, these are the conditions I referred to before, will be lost if the US cannot build electricity transmission faster than it already is. Mm. Because most of the law's impact depends on distributing clean energy, renewable energy, etc. from new infrastructure that needs permits. Wind farms need permits. Solar arrays need permits. And transmission lines need permits. It takes a decade or longer to construct a single transmission line because of permitting delays. Mm. Uh, but all of the environmental projections that they trumpeted about the IRA were based on the assumption that all necessary transmission lines will be complete in seven years. That is not going to happen. <laughs> if the projects aren't approved and the transmission lines don't go up, the emissions are not going to be reduced. Mm. So this is really, really important stuff. The US has 437,000 miles of transmission lines that were built in the 1950s and 1960s that were designed to last 50 years. Most of them are old. They need to be replaced and they need to expand them considerably. According to Princeton, they need over the next 30 years to build transmission lines at twice the pace they currently do for the next 30 years continuously to do it, to get where they need to go. Right now, transmission construction is slowing down, mm. not speeding up. Last year, they built 386 miles of new transmission capacity in the entirety of America. Why is it so difficult? It's because if you want to build a natural gas pipeline, you go to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, the FERC. If you want to build a trans transmission line, you go to everyone. You have to get the, the approval of the state, the county, the city, the landowners along the proposed route, every single one of them. And if you don't get the permission, you can't build it, which makes it impossible to build transmission lines these days, right? Uh, the, uh, and then there are the environmental reviews, which we haven't even discussed yet, because environmental reviews also apply to green projects, right? And so it's not just for fossil fuels. According to the DOE, right now, the Department of Energy, right now America has... Offshore wind projects capable of generating 42 megawatts of electricity with 18,581 megawatts of potential offshore wind power tied up in permitting battles. That gives you an example of where they're at. It so, really does. <laughs> so, so, okay, what does this permitting reform do? Number one, if the project is in the national interest, if the government mm. deems it as in the national interest, it can get approved by the FERC, just like a pipeline can. Right. That will make a big difference. Okay. That's good. It will limit environmental reviews for permits to two years and the window for lawsuits to 150 days after the final decision is made. Right now, environmental reviews currently take four and a half years on average. Mm. Now, note, that doesn't just apply for wind farms. It applies for pipelines as well. Right. Okay. okay. So that's the first little nudge of concern, right? Okay. There are also a public list of 25 projects which will be deemed strategically important. That way won't create shortcuts for those projects, but they will publicly sing signal what they're most trying to push through. Mm -hmm. And the government will have, this is a big one, the government will give the FERC the right to say who will pay for the transmission project. Because okay. right now, everyone tries to pawn off the cost to everyone else because there's a little bit for everyone. Yep. And it creates delays and underfunding. Okay. Now, all that is unarguably vital for the environment. Yes. But as always with Joe Manchin, there's a sting in the tail. <laughs> Strategically important list of projects has a minimum quota of fossil fuel projects, thanks to Joe Manchin. <laughs> it will also re reinstate Trump administration changes to the Clean Water Act, which limit challenges under the act to being solely about water and nothing else. Uh, they, and often they challenge pipelines through there. Yes. The bill will also accelerate the Mountain Valley Pipeline, a natural gas pipeline between Virginia and West Virginia that Joe Manchin is coincidentally very keen on. What a surprise. He, it's accumulated the Mountain Valley Pipeline project, 350 water quality violations and other environmental infractions <laughs> since its construction began four years ago. 
it's been blocked by the courts <laughs> because of its problems. And it will produce emissions to the equivalent of 26 coal power plants. And, uh, and the condition of this is that this goes through. Wow. Uh, Manchin himself was trying to sell this bill on Fox News by saying the bill would, quote, make sure we can take care of the American people with low energy prices, producing more oil, producing more gas. <laughs> and, um, and a draft leaked of this bill, Manchin's draft, yeah with a watermark on it from the American Petroleum Institute. <laughs> so that's interesting. Uh, people also couldn't help but notice that Joe Manchin is the number one congressional recipient of oil and gas cash, $716,000 this cycle. And the guy he did a deal with, Chuck Schumer, is the number one recipient of electricity utilities cash, $283,000 this cycle. Gas pipeline companies have gone from spending $20,000 on Joe Manchin in donations in 2020 to $331,000 in 2022 so far. And Schumer is the, second la is the single largest recipient of donations from one of the pipeline's backers, Next Era, receiving $283,000 this year from them and their employees. They're Schumer's second biggest donor this year after never having been in his top five before this year. How about that? Wow, so cynical. The, the left are not big fans <laughs> of this particular aspect of the deal. Over 80 House Democrats and 8 Senate Democrats call for the permitting reform to be stripped out of the government funding bill. Republicans were not fans either. They want it to be even stricter. <laughs> and, yeah. they, and they also are pissed off at Joe Manchin for striking the deal in the first place to get the Inflation Reduction Act signed because they wanted to sabotage it yes. so then they could make... At that point in time, both Joe Biden was hapless and was the new Jimmy Carter. Yes. But when he got that through, the, the, the narrative started to change. Um, so he got zero Republican support. He needed 10. Yep. And he got... He had trouble getting getting all the Democrats as well. Tim Kaine wanted nothing to do with the Mountain Valley Pipeline. No. He's a Virginia He's senator. <laughs> and, uh, and Bernie Sanders just said flat, no, no, no. Also, 18 Republican Attorney General sent a letter saying that, saying that this would create a scenario where FERC would have the authority to determine the national interest and require companies to build with orders and where. Yes, that's exactly what it would do. That is the point. Anyway, in the end, it looked like there was going to be a shutdown over this and Manchin backed down. Right. Schumer says he'll try and sneak it into the defense funding bill next. <laughs> <laughs> so that is the full story of the IRA and permitting fraud. Now, now I've, I don't know how much you were paying attention to all that, but I have a question for you, yes. which is, given what I just told you yes. about the fact this permitting reform is absolutely vital for the environment. It really is. Yes. But there is so much bullshit in there yes, yes. with Joe Manchin. Do you favor it passing or not? Because that's a good question. Because I think it's an interesting question. It is and a very it's, it's a question Democrats are having to confront. Very interesting question. Yeah, uh, I'll leave that one as homework for the <laughs> for me. You'd be unsurprised to hear, given I'm the king of the pragmatists, that I would definitely support it. I, because, I can tell that you because, would. Yeah, because even though yeah. the Mountain Valley Pipeline is, is, is just a hunk <laughs> of shit, <laughs> and like and 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 every change that Manchin has made is is a terrible change for the environment. Yes, it's just they've got a gun to our heads on this. You just need permitting reform. If you do not get permitting reform, you will not get what anywhere close to what you need to do to reduce greenhouse gases in America. So it's just, just one of those things. Okay. Anyway. But anyway, um, that's enough of that. Okay. You had some, you, there, there, let's get into the Dave zone now. You want to talk about Canon? Eileen Cannon? Oh, want, yes. And you want to talk about Maloney in Brazil? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so uh, Eileen Cannon. The Trump appointed judge yes. in Florida, yep. who, as we've mentioned before, Trump actually tries to get her for, uh, yes, for cases. Mm. Um, so her latest intervention in the Trump documents Mar-a-Lago raid, you might remember, she appointed Raymond Deary mm. as uh, the special master who was reviewing the documents. Now, we discussed, I think, last week, that Raymond Deary has immediately started going in directions which the Trump legal team doesn't like. Yes. Despite the fact that he was the suggestion of the Trump legal team, <laughs> yes. though very quickly agreed to by yes. the government. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. Among other things, Raymond Deary has said that given how many times now Trump has said publicly that the FBI planted evidence in Mar-a-Lago... He has said, if you're going to keep saying that, your lawyers actually have to swear to that in court. They have to make a sworn statement that they believe the FBI planted evidence. Yeah. 
Now, there's obviously no way that they're going to do that. <laughs> In the same way, they're not going to make a sworn statement that Trump actually declassified documents with his mind or any other tool uh, available to him. But... Eileen Cannon has come through for Trump once again in the last 24 hours. This is why I haven't read it yet. She has overruled Raymond Deary. She has said that Trump's lawyers do not need to swear in court that they believe that the FBI planted evidence. Do we know why? Or? Well, the lawyers are claiming, mm. oh, well, we need to review uh, what the FBI has pulled out of Mar-a-Lago oh, first. Okay. That, you know, how can we make a claim about that before we review it? But that does not stop oh. Trump claiming at every opportunity yeah. that the FBI <laughs> has uh, has planted evidence. So, yeah. uh, yes, Eileen Cannon still behaving exactly as we expected her to, uh, yeah, to behave. Yeah. By the way, you might be wondering why Trump's lawyers are so keen to see these th this evidence. Because yes. every, every single motion they they make yes. relates to wanting to see the the classified files. You yes. might be wondering why they're so keen. Yeah. I can't think of any legal reason why they'd be so keen, but no. a cynical person yes. might suggest that they might want to cherry pick the least offensive documents and to leak them to the press. Yes. That's what a cynical person suggests. Oh, yeah, yeah, suggest. I'm sure. I'm, sure. <laughs> I'm not cynical though, so I would never suggest yeah. that. <laughs> so, yeah. They probably also don't think that Trump's actually told them what was in there. Yeah. They they probably yeah. just, they probably want to find out yeah, uh, yeah, well, yeah I, what I, was I, in there because it would be helpful and they know that yeah I, I, I suspect Trump doesn't know like if yeah. if yeah, if, yes. if it's anything like we're being led to believe his yes. place is just a mess of documents just lying all over the place yes but not on the floor because he wouldn't do that no <laughs> he was very would clear not about do that. that all right okay so that's the canon update uh, tell floor. tell me about Maloney in Brazil. Yes, so uh, Georgia Maloney, the head of the Brothers of Italy party, um, will be the next Prime Minister of yep. Italy following the elections. Mm. Her party got 26% of the vote, so that makes them by far the biggest partner within the right-wing coalition mm. that will take government. There was a very good article in The Compensation about this by Duncan McDonnell from Griffith University and an Italian whose name I am forgetting. I'm very sorry, but we'll put it Can in the... Can we put it in the homework? Yep. yep um, it's, it to me later on. Uh, yeah. Um, and he's pointed out that this right-wing coalition has been around for a long time, so it used to be led by Silvio Berlusconi's yep. party. Uh, Salvio Mattini's party had a, a go at it as well. What he points out is, so Maloney's party has its actual roots in fascism. Mm. In uh, It's in so-called post-fascism, mm. which is what fascism turned into after fascism mm. had been completely discredited. And he said this coalition has turned into a populist centre-right movement with a far-right edge, which was the Berlusconi version of it, into a populist far-right movement with a centre-right edge. Uh, so that is that is what you've got now. Uh, part of the story is also that the left is doing historically badly in Italian elections at the, uh, at the moment. Um, so this comes on the heels of the Swedish election result, which was also won by a right-wing coalition, where the Sweden Democrats were the biggest vote getters within mm. that coalition, I think, with twenty percent of the vote, mm. that is another party that actively has its roots in fascism. But the, in Sweden, in the case of Sweden, the prime yes. minister will be from the moderate party. Absolutely, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. And in, yeah. in fact, it's not even clear that the mm. Sweden Democrats will get ministerial yeah. positions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that party actually actively has its roots in neo-Nazism. It yeah. comes from the Swedish neo-Nazism mm. movement mm. of uh, of the nineteen nineties. But yeah, they're they're not in as strong a position mm. as the brothers of Italy are. That I think they're going to demand ministerial positions, but it's not going to be clear that mm. uh, they'll get them. So obviously, in these multi-party systems, no one gets a huge amount of the vote. Like no one mm. comes close to getting uh, fifty percent of the vote. It's all done through these coalitions. Uh, Far-right parties in these coalitions is not a new thing. What is new is a is a post-fascist prime minister mm. like that is that is an actual first uh with in the system i think it's an incredibly worrying development but it is one that was expected despite the fact that this was referred to by some newspapers as a shocking election result this is actually one that had been predicted for for months yeah 
um, that uh, that that this was coming. Now it's always tempting to look at these things and to see a wave. Um, it's uh, you could add to that, you know, Viktor Orban increasing his margin mm. in uh, in Hungary this year. You could also add, so even though um, Marine Le Pen actually underperformed polls mm. in the French presidential yeah. election, she's still got a bigger share of the vote uh, in the runoff round mm. this time than the Front National has been able to get yet. Okay. Right. I, th- I think. Yeah. I am not sure about that. I mean, that one was largely sort of portrayed as a big victory for Macron because of the fact that he overperformed polls. Yeah. But I don't think he got as much of the vote this time as he got last time. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. So I, I, I would also I would also throw in. It's not. I don't think the the right wing populists are doing a great job in Britain at the moment. Well, no. I mean, <laughs> it, it, this is the thing. It, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's never all going in one direction. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. At the time. Yeah. Now, the, up like now that Liz, Liz Truss has completely yeah. crashed. <laughs> yes. That's uh, right. The pound. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I you know this I think is just this is what happens when you have Thatcherism without Thatcher's gravitas. Yeah. You actually see it for what it is. Mm. Um. Yeah, and social democrats in Germany as well. Yeah, yeah, Australia. social yeah. social democrats yeah. in Germany. Yeah. One in Colombia, you got a yeah. left wing government yeah. after years of yeah. right wing rule. Yeah. In Australia, the Labor Party. Won. Mm. I mean, yeah. it's never all going in no. one direction yeah. um, at the same time, uh, which is important. Mm. One of the things that is interesting, though, is that we do have this cluster, um, particularly looking at Hungary and Italy, yeah. of leaders who had definitely been sympathetic to Putin. Mm in the recent past. Now they have distanced themselves yeah, not anymore. from from Putin. So Maloney well, has pretty yeah, significantly yeah. distanced herself. Yeah, she's she's pretty pro Ukraine. Uh, right? yeah, 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 she's very pro Ukraine yeah. now. Orban hasn't exactly distanced himself from mm. Putin, but uh, and you know, he did, Hungary's not sending military aid to Ukraine, but mm. at the same time he's and even Marine Le Pen was forced to distance herself from uh, Putin somewhat. And there was a Pew study that showed that among voters of these parties uh, favor favorability to Russia had dropped significantly. I'll put down the homework as well. Then I say the homework uh, for those who don't understand. Look in the, in the in the blurb underneath the videos, either YouTube or the Facebook video, and you'll see description of links you can follow. Yes, yeah. Yeah. and I mean it's not very hard to see how this transformation has taken place. Certainly, for a lot of right wing parties, for a long time, Putin represented something that they liked, yeah. which was this muscular anti-liberal alternative uh, to Western liberalism. But the thing about a style of politics that is based on responding to a perceived threat is that for a lot of Europeans, that threat is coming from Putin Mm. and that the invasion of Ukraine turned him from this sort of admirable figure into an actual threat. So that, that shift among right wing parties has been pretty genuine there's been, though, a lot of speculation about how long will it actually last. Mm. Uh, you know, as the war drags on, as we discussed earlier in the episode four hours ago or something, <laughs> given happy uh, you know, g- given <laughs> that the US is backing the uh, you know the Ukrainian position mm. of we want all of our land back, it could go on for a very long time. Uh, but as we have also discussed, as we discussed last week, the cracks in solidarity actually seem to be taking place on the other side mm. with all of these, uh, with Xi and Modi mm. and Erdogan, um, yeah, uh, backing away from uh, backing away from Putin. Mm. Um, so uh, yeah, so basically, I'm saying don't misinterpret this as some kind of uh, pro-Putin yeah, wave, but yeah. it is a very genuine. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and and it's you know it's not the whole world, but there has been this um, uh, yeah this this right wing surge at least in some countries um, in uh, in Western Europe. This can only happen with some degree of acceptance of other right wing parties. I think is another very important mm-hmm. point to make in these coalitional systems. They have to be allowed into those uh, into those coalitions, as we've seen in Italy now. This post-fascist party is actually at the heart of the uh, at the heart of the coalition. In Sweden, it's still got a more marginal status, despite the fact that it's the biggest party within that coalition. Now, I would say the biggest 
national election in the world is coming up this week, though. It's the biggest because this is the biggest country mm. that is going to a national election this week, which is Brazil. Yeah. Uh, so just a little preview of that election. It has looked for a long time like Bolsonaro is going to lose that mm. election, not just because of the polls, but because of the things that Bolsonaro is saying, which is essentially that he expects widespread election fraud. He has claimed that election officials can change the results through election machines and leave no trace. Who would ever suggest that? Yes, yeah, yeah. He has <laughs> absolutely claimed this. He has basically claimed that this uh, will happen. Mm. So given that this is an American-focused podcast... Uh, and can I, for the record, just yes. say to our YouTube betters yes. that... This is not true. This is absolutely not true. You cannot do that. Yes, this is disinformation coming from Bolsonaro, <laughs> That's right. not from Pep. And we okay? disapprove of that disinformation. And Chaz and I, we, we agreed before this episode, Chaz is not going to write, <laughs> Bolsonaro is right. I'm definitely not going to do that. Uh, in in all caps, because no. we we know where that leads. Yes, we do. <laughs> anyway, we'll uh, we'll have to see this how this election goes. I have absolutely no idea what the quality of uh, polling is like in Brazil. I don't know what the mm. track record of polls is. I think this is one of these cases where, like Trump in the lead up to the twenty twenty election, it's the words and actions of Bolsonaro that are actually a lot more informative than mm. the polls are. He clearly expects to lose. There have been um, increasing signs that even his evangelical allies in Brazil uh, have not been impressed with him (laughs) recently. Astonishing. He was damaged, uh, definitely, by by COVID Mm. um, because he made Trump look like Anthony Fauci (laughs) in terms of the way that he responded. Remember, this was the guy who at the outset of the pandemic said that it wasn't really going to affect Brazilians because Brazilians are constitutionally strong. That's right. The Brazilian can swim in sewage That's and right. be unharmed by it. This was before Bolsonaro went on to, I'm pretty sure, break the world record for number of infections, <laughs> COVID infections, <laughs> by a single leader. Yeah. And can I also say while we're at it that yeah. it's not true that Brazilians can swim in sewage and Bolsonaro should get vaccinated. Yes. Can I yeah, also yeah, say yeah, that? This is where, once again... <laughs> Once again, this is Bolsonaro saying these things, oh, dear. not uh, not Pep. Yeah, uh, yes. so, YouTube. If you're listening, um, can, I just wanted to just sorry, you finished on Bolsonaro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to just um, uh, also just just pick up on one thing, which is yeah. it just just hits on one of my pet peeves of the week. Yes, <laughs> which is as always, you are extremely careful with your wording, which is very welcome. Yes, and you kept on using the phrase the the word post fascist yes. to describe the party yes, and describe yeah, yeah, yeah. Maloney. Whereas what people have been, what my pet peeve of the week is people talking about Maloney like she is the reincarnation of Mussolini, which is just not the case. And in particular, I am um, not that I'm not, not, like, yeah, I'm yeah. not like I'm the lone supporter, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but just in particular, one, one of her major opponents, Matteo yeah. Renzi, yeah. from the centre left, the ex prime minister, he actually was defending her on air, saying, mm. "This is just, yeah, I'll just play the grab." Hang on, is this in Italian? No. That is not a danger for Italian democracy. Uh, She is uh, my rival. I'm rival. We will continue to uh, fight each other. But the ideas are now there is a risk uh, of fascism in Italy is absolutely a fake news. If you didn't understand that, he said the risk of fascism in Italy mm. is fake news. Is that yeah. The, the, uh, like, he doesn't like her, that's for sure. No, I think what yeah. she represents yeah. is is very bad. And it's I'm, going to be an extremely aggressive anti-immigration platform. Yeah. Uh, it, it's going to be Viktor Orban-style crackdown on uh, radical gender education. Mm. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, Matt, yeah. I, I, I compare it for, for those... For those, I'm not. I'm no expert. Actually, yeah. you, you tell me if this is right. Actually, yeah. because you probably know more about it than I do. I think of her as, as kind of slightly more extreme Bernardi. Corey Bernardi. Corey Bernardi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, yeah. You talk about some Italian politician. No, 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 of course, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Is that about right? Yeah, I, I, I reckon about a standard deviation. Yeah, okay. More, yeah, uh, yeah, more extreme than yeah, Corey. Okay. But like, I think she's quite similar to Marine Le Pen. Yeah, in, okay. And Marine mm-hmm. Le Pen 
made this big effort with the Front National to remove the explicitly fascist elements from it, including her her dad's anti-Semitism. Yeah. Yeah, I cool. think it's a lot like that, but right. it's not good. Uh, anything else on that? Mm, no. no. Okay, all right. Just one more little thing. I'm just, oh, we're getting pretty late. Okay, oh, okay. Make, make, this, make this quick. Make okay. This quick. Make this quick. Um, okay, no stacks nugget. I'll save that for L. L, you have so many stats nuggets coming your way. Um, very excited about El Hardy. Uh, El Hardy, Tuesday or Wednesday, I'm not sure yet. It'll be one of them. Yeah. Um, I just want to do a quick, I also end up on a quick immigration update because I just like to stop talking about this. Okay. <laughs> Ever since I opened that can of worms, yeah. every every podcast I'm doing more. Um, I will, I just want to say um, that uh, uh, conservatives, don't like you calling what Ron DeSantis did, the Martha's Vineyard thing, mm. a stunt. Uh, I think it's definitely a stunt, as is Abbott sending unauthorized migrants up to Chicago and New York and yes, DC. Yeah, Although yeah. that the, the Abbott stunt is a much less flagrant stunt, but it's still a stunt. It is uh, a stunt. And, uh, yeah. And I'll, I'll tell you why it's a stunt. I'll tell you, you yes. can tell. Yes. This is how you can tell. As of Friday, the number of illegal immigrants arriving on buses provided by Governor Abbott in New York 2,700 since mm. August. The number arriving on buses from El Paso is 4,230. Wow. Yet yeah, no one's heard of the El Paso buses. No, no. The reason why no one's heard of the El Paso buses, you might think, oh, it's because it's a Democrat that's sending them. Oh, partisan yeah. media. <laughs> no, it's not because it's a Democrat. It's because the, A, the El Paso mayor doesn't constantly call press conferences about it. <laughs> And secondly, the El Paso Mayor coordinates with New York. Yes. For the good of the migrants. Yes. <laughs> and it's because it's good to share them around a bit, but it is. do it in a way which is actually in the migrants' favor so they can be looked after with appropriate facilities. Yes. Which is what the guy from El Paso does. So no one cares. Yes. Okay. So that's how you can tell it's a stunt that they're not doing that. Also, let's not forget the guy who I mentioned once while uh, miles back, who I haven't mentioned since, Doug Ducey. From oh Arizona, yes. the governor from Arizona, who's also been seeing migrants in New York and DC, and no one talks about him yeah. because he gives them notice. Yeah. He doesn't surprise them because he's not being a dickhead. Yeah. And so and so he gets no credit for it. <laughs> but uh, the, uh, but uh, anyway, so that's an interesting stunt and actually carrying out the migrants yes. with with bad faith, right? Yes. The, uh, which is what the, the, the acting like you care when you go with bad faith. Um, but I also want to give a bit of a correction on this, which is that I was saying that I agreed with Greg Abbott to the extent that blue states need to pull their weight a bit more when it comes to asylum seekers. Mm -hmm. But I saw some numbers yep. that suggested to me I underestimated how much asylum se how many asylum seekers do end up in blue states. Right. These are the numbers. As of late August, nearly 750,000 people are in the system awaiting asylum hearings at this point in time based on court records mm -hmm. from TRAC. Yep. Right? The TRAC is the organization that do this. More than 125,000 of those 750,000 people are in California. Mm. More than 110,000 of those people are in New York. Right. 98,000 of them are in Florida. 75,000 of them are in Texas. Ah. And then the, then the next one's down in New Jersey, Massachusetts, and Maryland. So the blue states are doing their part. Yes. At least the people who are formally in the system doing what you're supposed to be doing. Right. right? Uh, and I also wanted to make three quick points about immigration from Republicans, all of which I think are fair, which I haven't get, uh, cited before. The, um, okay. One is there is a good reason to sort out the whole highway of unauthorized migrants thing, and that is how much it funds Mexican cartels. Mm -hmm. That is a real thing. Uh, one estimate from Homeland Security is that the cartels make $13 billion a year from aiding migration. Right. It's up from $500 million in 2018. Yeah. So like these days, they're doing more more people people moving and people smuggling than drugs. Yes. So the uh, so that's the first thing. That, 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 that is actually a real issue mm. because they're taking over Mexico at the moment. Yes. So yeah, the uh, it's a lot of money. Secondly, it's true that not a lot of people coming over have criminal records. The right like to go on about criminal records yes. a lot. They like to cite numbers like 10,763 people intercepted in 2021 had criminal records, which is true. Mm. But when you think about it, there were 1.7 million people intercepted. Yes. Yeah. So as a percentage, it's about 6%, which, you know, that's not nothing. No. But it's also not swamped by no. criminal records. And also that's criminal records, which could be a lot of things. Yes. They're not all murderers and rapists, right? No. Um, but we need to at the same time acknowledge 
that the people who are intercepted are least likely to have criminal records. Mm. The people with the criminal records are most likely to try to avoid the border patrol. Yes. And that's why I remind you of the 500,000 people who, who are called godaways. Right. The people who avoid the border patrol successfully. Mm. Those people are probably, I'm not saying they're all criminals, but I'm saying they're mo more likely have a higher rate of dodginess for whatever reason. That's why they're avoiding the border patrol. So we do need to acknowledge that. Okay. All right. Um, and the other thing we need to acknowledge is that there was a recent DHS intelligence report, hmm. supposedly. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so, no, but you, just, you, you hear about it in newspapers, you don't see the report. Yes, you know? yeah. So, warning the Border Patrol to look out for Venezuelans who may be hiding a criminal record because apparently, according to this report, Maduro has been allowing prisoners to leave jails that he thinks will migrate to America. Ah, oh, shades of the Fidel old, Castro. The, the old, the old Trump, the, the old Trump uh, murderers, rapists, and then <laughs> like the uh, I'm not sure they are murderers and rapists, but they, I'm just saying that that apparently, according to this report, mm. some were intercepted in caravans in Mexico a few months. Yeah, ago. yeah. So anyway, so I just need to just want to flag that because I haven't mentioned that before. It's not always possible to catch people because obviously, if they got caught, they wouldn't they would have their papers. Mm. They, they wouldn't have any papers. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's hard to trace. One more thing, and this is actually probably a really important thing, which I should have mentioned before now, but I didn't have the numbers mm -hmm. until now. If you have any kind of functional system, if you're processing asylum seekers, you need to A, process them quickly enough so that you don't ruin the lives of the people who you reject. Yes. Or B, the, the, you have to have a system where the people who don't qualify mm. have to leave or I like otherwise I have to have there has to be something happen to them. Mm. Otherwise, then there's no reason for people to to apply. Like they, they, like you have no incentives to not come if, yeah. if if there's no consequences if you if you don't don't qualify for asylum. In FY in, f in fiscal year 2019, out of the asylum cases that were heard, 15 percent were granted mm -hmm. asylum, uh, 31 percent were denied. Mm -hmm. 11% uh, were other. I don't know what that means. Maybe appealing. Mm. I don't know. And 41% uh, had no asylum application filed, as in they dropped out of the process. Right. So, out of that 41%, there could be any reason, any yes. number of reasons yep. why. They could, like, often these people don't speak English and they get confused. Mm. They get sent around all over the place. I'm not casting any aspersion on those 41%. Yes. But what I am saying is that even if you ignore them, yep. 32% of the cases heard were granted. Yeah. The um, uh, so you need to have a system which is fast enough yes. that the people who aren't granted can go home in a way that doesn't screw them up. No, at the moment that's not the system. Yeah, it takes seven years yes. at yeah, the moment. Yeah. So if you are someone who's been through the se through a seven year process mm. and you get rejected, you can't go back. No. it's just it's completely inhumane, and you've set you've tied down roots. You probably have kids. Yeah, it's just impossible. So you need to have a process where it takes less than six months mm. to get to that point, and then. You can be in a position where you send them, they send them home. That's why I always said remain in Mexico. If you did it properly, yeah. if you actually properly, properly, properly did it, so that was fast, then that could work. Mm. But the, the moment the system, it's it's too slow to be humane, mm -hmm. and then you have the whole system breaks down, mm. and that's the problem they've got. Yes, oh, well, that's a problem they've got. Yes. We've discussed many, many problems. I just wanted to give you the numbers because okay. I, I hadn't heard that before. Um, and that, and, and, and having said all that, I just want to just rule off, uh, r draw a line under this by saying that the, that there was a pilot during the summer under the Biden administration that rejected about half the applicant applicants very quickly, right? Rather than the usual 15%, because usually they yeah, reject 15% yeah. and the rest they let through for, yeah. for, for, for applying. In this case, it rejected half of them. And that, if, if that would, if that was accurate, then that's good. Because it's quick and it's, and, and you know, it's, um, it suggests to me that there is an obvious common sense path forward here if you actually care about immigrants. Right. And I've heard literally no one propose it. What's that? Well, no, I'm just saying. Like if, like, yeah, 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 yeah. Like what I'm just saying. To have a uh, quick system. Okay, right, yes. Where, yeah, yeah. where, you, don't, where you, we don't let people settle yeah, yeah. if they don't qualify for asylum, but at the same time, you give them the full opportunity to, to right. be heard. Yeah. Well, that seems to be kind of obvious if you care about immigrants. Yeah. And literally no one is proposing it. Mm. So draw your own conclusions from that. Okay. I will. And we've Happy been talking hundred. for more than two hours. Yes, we have. Uh, I don't well, know if the battery is actually still. Like, I don't oh know. God, when did imagine. it stop recording us? Like, <laughs> that is a really, that's a really interesting question. I hope it's a, I hope it's a hundredth anniversary. Uh, yeah. 
uh, appropriate batter, battery. Yes. But you know, like people, people wanted a big hundred. We gave him a big hundred. We gave him a big hundred. I, I gave him a real big hundred on the IRA. <laughs> <laughs> Everything you ever wanted to know <laughs> about the Inflation Reduction Act, you got it. Just about caught up, you know. We haven't yeah. done COVID, but fuck that. <laughs> that's, uh, Everyone's no, we'll do, pretending that we'll, it doesn't exist. We'll do COVID at one point in time, but okay. just but that, that, that's not much anyway. So um, but how's it feel to be caught up on the 100? Isn't that exciting? Yeah, largely. that's very exciting. Yeah, you don't look excited. <laughs> no, 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 I, I, let's, let's get everyone excited on our way out with one more... One more run of the unofficial anthem of Pep 100, which is the Space Force theme. I'll just start underneath now. Dr. Dave, thank you very much for these 100 episodes. My pleasure. Thank you very much for these 100 episodes. Thank you for everybody who has contributed. Thank you and for everyone as well. Also for, for the everyone. corrections. Well, yes. <laughs> and also to everyone who's listened. Yes. Thank you so much. We really do appreciate you. And we yes. uh, look forward to the next 100. Yeah. See you, Dr. Dave. See you, Chase. See you, guys.